So good evening, um, everyone. Welcome to join the Interdisciplinary Roundtable webinar on archaeology, architecture, and public engagement, uh, preserving a century-old underground reservoir in uh, Bishop Hill, Hong Kong, organized by Department of Anthropology, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. My name is Sharon Wong Wai Yi. I'm the um, Assistant Professor of the De uh, Department of Anthropology, CHK. I'm the host of today's webinar. A central underground reservoir in Bishop Hill, also called Wall Chai Hill, Sakit May, Kowloon, Hong Kong, was discovered by um, general public on the 28th December 2020 of historical uh, significance. This reservoir was built on 1904 as part of Kowloon Waterworks uh, gravitation scheme. According to old colonial documents, it arose big social interest and media attraction. Um, the unique structure featuring uh, artists um, as, as standard, many locals and experts who did not expect it, um, there would be a uh, heritage site of this scale in Hong Kong. It also forced authorities to uh, hold the work and also discuss the further action on preserving the site. Today, our webinar will use two approaches to discuss the preservation of this underground reservoir in Bishop Hill, Hong Kong. The first is the interdisciplinary approach combining archaeology, architecture, and public engagement. And the second, we hope to use these various case studies on ancient and contemporary water management system and facilities from different countries as theme of references. We believe that it will show light on the future direction on preserving these sites. This webinar is divided into two parts. We have two Q&A sessions by the end of presentation. Each speaker will have 30 minutes uh, to present their works. We are welcome for attendance audience to raise your questions to our speakers. For the webinar attendance, please feel free to put your question to Q&A box. For Facebook Live attendance, please put your questions under the Facebook Live comment box. Our webinar colleagues will collect your questions uh, for the Q&A sessions. If you want one of our speakers to answer your questions, you may also mention his or her name in your question. So for our first speaker, uh, Mr. Leki Wong and Ms. Uh, Sita Nam, the topic um, is Shield Nights on Century Old Water Conservancy in Hong Kong. So let me give you a very brief introduction for uh, two of our speakers. Mr. Leki Wong is a registered architect, co-founder of Hong Kong Heritage Exploration, uh, he hold his Bachelor uh, of Honours degrees and Master degrees of Architecture at the University of Hong Kong. And uh, he also a member of Hong Kong Institute of Architects and participating uh, architects for a wide variety of projects, including heritage conservation in Hong Kong. Nikki has also been researching for heritage, heritages of Hong Kong. Ms. Sita Lam received um, her Bachelor of Social Science uh, Honours degree and Master of Heri uh, architecture and master of arts in philosophy at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Her interest lies within the reins of Sekou's arche uh, architecture. Lam's discover a disused underground surface reservoir where she pro um, proposed as designed for her master thesis. So for um, Nikki and Shita, please. So stop sharing. So please, uh, Nikki, please share your PowerPoint. Okay, Jita, we will have a brief introduction on that first. Yes, uh, I'm Shita, a graduate from the School of Architecture in CUHK, and I discovered this underground structure two years ago and proposed a design in revitalizing uh, this sentence in Hong Kong. <laughs> As mentioned by Sharon, in the past couple of weeks, the discovery of this century-old reservoir in Hong Kong has been widely reported. It aroused unprecedented public concerns and discussions towards the conservation and the future of a disused underground surface reservoir. Today, Nikki and I would like to share the story of the Bishop Hill Reservoir and discuss the future of it with you all. This century-old structure is an underground water reservoir located in the heart of the Kowloon city at the summit of Bishop Hill. 
Aside from this, there are others located in Kowloon Peninsula as part of a wider water strategies. This not only function as infrastructural component, but also creates urban voice. Bishop Hill is fascinating is in identity. The arguments towards the Bishop Hill's open space can be dated back to 1970s due to its inefficiencies. Since then, the local residents form a group to build and manage their own public spaces at Bishop Hill. These organic public spaces allow diverse recreational activities and create another form of life in the city. Up until 2017, the government finally decided to demolish the underground structure at the summits of Bishop Hill for future planning. On 27 December 2020, the demolition work unearthed an underground structure by removing part of its roof and structural columns. The exposed interior shocked the locals and soon the local realized the uniqueness of this underground structure and called a halt to the excavation operations. The discovery of this underground structure caused a huge widespread through social media. Many members from the public immediately conducted various researches on the historical and architectural significance, forcing the authority to halt the demolition plan. Without the social media attention and the uproar of local resistance in the preservation of the architecture, the results will have likely be different. I will now show a clip of the interior of this century old reservoir recorded by the public for a better understanding and fill the space inside the reservoir first. So the pen diagrams on the left indicate the damaged proportion and the structural arrangement of this underground structure. The reservoir is in circular form of around 47 meters diameter and, and surrounded by a concrete retaining wall system. There are 108 granite columns that are designed to support the roof, the Roman arches in red bricks labeled one, and the concrete arch roof labeled at two from this double arches system, which is able to transfer both vertical load and horizontal load down to the column and through the boundary retaining wall. The section drawing illustrate the surface reservoir is seven meters deep and is designed to hold two million gallons of water under a thin layer of soil. The reservoir was designed as a part of the Cold and Water Works Gravitation Scheme in 1900. It was completed in 1904 and served the community until 1970s. So what are the significance of this century old reservoir? Firstly, it's in contribution to the early urbanization of Hong Kong. The reservoir is located in the new Kowloon area, which was ceded to the British government in 1898. Prior to the southern Kowloon was a military base having a population of 40,000 only. After the British government gained the control over the entire Kowloon area, it started to turn Kowloon from villages into a modern city. Water is essential to human survival it was necessary to create our new water supply network to tackle the needs of a dramatic population growth and the government ambitions of this future city. In 1900, a new water works system was proposed by the directors of public works, Mr. Lauren Gibbs, in his report of water supply. Mr. Lauren Gibbs is a civil engineer. He proposed to build the Bishop Hill Service Reservoir with the Kowloon storage reservoir to change the main source of water supply from the Guang water to capture water by a scheme called Kowloon Water Works Gravitation Scheme. 
So the Bishop Hill Reservoir is important as it witnessed the transformation of water supply system in the early urbanization progress of Hong Kong. As mentioned earlier, the Bishop Hill Surface Reservoir was designed together with the Colon Storage Reservoir as an entire network to provide 519,000 gallons of water to the community per day. I believe the historical value of the Bishop Hill Reservoir should be considered and evaluated as a group with the Colon Storage Reservoir. In 2009, five historical structures of Colon Storage Reservoir were declared monuments already. The Bishop Hill Water Reservoir is indeed a Mr. Heritage, considering its contribution to the water supply system and early developments of Kowloon. Affected by the periods and influence of that time, the design of the reservoir is a relative of the Western neoclassical architecture. The best known symbols are its Roman arches in red bricks and symmetrical geometry. The, the design of the reservoir is not merely based on aesthetic concern, but the best form and structure in complying its function and size constraints. Closer to home, red bricks constructions was widely adopted in the colonial architecture of the Edwardian periods, such as the Western Market and the Hong Kong Museum of Medical Science. The materials adopted in the Bishop Hill Reservoir also mark the transitional periods between traditional and modern architecture in Hong Kong. Today, Hong Kong is a very famous concrete jungle in the world, but the use of the reinforced concrete actually happened only after 1910. Bricks and stone were the major materials in constructions before then. In comparison, other reservoirs completed in the same period in Hong Kong are constructed in red bricks and stone only. The Bishop Hill Reservoir would have been a very pioneering technique in this time with the combination of concrete and brickworks. One point to note here is Bishop Hill Reservoir is very likely to have adopted the local granite in its constructions because Hong Kong is rich in granite resources, which cover almost a third of the area of Hong Kong. Same question to the use of cement. The first cement factory in Hong Kong is established in 1898. It would be a unique structure compared to other similar systems in the world if it has adopted the local materials in its formation. Uh, sorry, hello uh, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Sita, and thank you, um, Sharon, for introducing. And uh, as everyone may know, I I'm an architect in Hong Kong, and then um, we want a Facebook page that uh, shares our findings and in heritage of Hong Kong. Uh, not really very in depth research, but uh, we do love to share our findings. Uh, for the last week, um, when we discovered that um, this heritage is being demolished, we uh, immediately share to our page, and then um, we expect to arouse some uh, attention on this heritage, but uh, we didn't expect uh, there's so much um, huge attention. And then in the end, uh, the government really uh, ceased the uh, demolition works. So um, uh, I will continue to explain more on the gravitation scheme um, and also uh, uh, some of the heritage um, um, adaptation, what, what of the future use we can use this place. Um, for the Um, for the gravitation scheme, um, the upstream we know that is a uh, Kowloon Reservoir. And then how does that relate to the uh, midstream, the Bishop Hill um, underground reservoir? There's, um, the principle of the gravitation scheme is um, about the um, level difference, the altitude difference uh, between the uh, different um, levels. So when the Kowloon Reservoir is at high level, and then when the lower um, Bishop Hill Reservoir is at lower level, no matter how much undulating is uh, the pipes work um, all the way along, um, the water will go uh, automatically uh, due to gravity force. 
So uh, the gravitation scheme is a very efficient way that uh, do not need to use um, electricity, do not need to use any bumping station. And also the uh, storage reservoir in Bishop Hill can help to um, relieve the pressure. And also at the same time, uh, when a, a certain amount of uh, water is accumulated in the reservoir, they can uh, again use gravity feed to flow to the population and downstream. So as this is um, um, technological and also a um, um, sanitary and public health uh, um, construction for uh, that time 100 years ago in Hong Kong. Um, when we talk about, um, um, Shi Tex also talked about a little bit on the history and the landscape of Hong Kong. Um, uh, Britain um, get control of Hong Kong step by step. Uh, the first, uh, they get Hong Kong Island and then later on the Kowloon Peninsula and later on New Kowloon and New Territories. Um, there is um, already some reservoir in, back in the 1860s on Hong Kong Island, but the Kowloon Reservoir is the first one uh, in Kowloon, um, which is located here. When we talk about the uh, uh, water supply, um, before uh, the Britons can uh, get control of um, New Kowloon and the New Territories, the first water supply system is just using the underground well and also with the help of a pumping station that supply waters at only at the Kowloon Peninsula. Uh, but because um, there is not much um, huge uh, or high level mountain in Kowloon Peninsula, um, they cannot build any reservoirs in Kowloon Peninsula. So later on, when um, they get control of the new territories and the new Kowloon, they um, is able to build a reservoir up on the hill here. So that is um, what the gravitation scheme um, can help to supply the, the whole Kowloon here. Uh, we understand that um, Hong Kong is a British colony. And back in the uh, days, um, Britain is one of the first, very first um, country that um, goes to the in industrialization and they have a uh, uh, great uh, experience in, in tackle the dense population problem in the cities and some of the um, um, speakers here may, may or, or the audience here may know that uh, Chadwick's fathers and son is which is a great contribution in England and Hong Kong on the old city reform public health and also sanitation and while our gravitation scheme in Kowloon is also supervised by by uh, Chadwick's so that uh, is um, clear that it's not just a simple uh, or technological construction, it's also about the public health and sanitation for Hong Kong. And later on, um, while uh, we uh, have a uh, water supply over the uh, Kowloon Peninsula, Kowloon uh, is a war period. And for the, we have the news here that uh, uh, Hong Kong is already one of the world biggest uh, shipbuilding industry in Hong Kong, um, which is ranked uh, number eight in the world. So it's also, um, when we uh, talk about um, 1890s, the Kowloon is uh, just a very little, it's already very established uh, thanks to the um, infrastructure facilities and also including the water supply system. Some other Asia Pacific region also have um, use of this gravitation schemes um, with the help of Britain. For example, uh, uh, Japan, uh, they hired England engineer to help them to build uh, one of the very first uh, modernized uh, water diesel um, in the past is British, British colony. They used this uh, kind of a um, gravitation scheme and also the storage reservoir. And later on, uh, we have speaker talk about the Sydney case. Uh, the Paddington reservoir is uh, not 100% um, gravitation feed. Um, they have used the uh, pumping station to drive the water supply. But um, the, you can see the structure is uh, very, um, similar to Hong Kong, uh, the function is the same, but um, we, we can see the local adaptation with um, Australian uh, timber used as the column and also a different um, um, building, technology, building technique. We think that um, um, the, the, the technology that is um, very well leading technology back to 100 years ago, but uh, when they adopt to the, uh, each uh, area, they use some local adaptation and local materials. So uh, what's next um, in our architect minds? Um, we, for our architects, we have to understand the size 
uh, the site is uh, on a very hilly site uh, without infrastructure, without um, much vehicular access. And, but uh, the technology nowadays can help us to visualize um, all the, um, before we think about the design, we can visualize the space inside and also the, the damage portion. Uh, at this moment, I, I can share some of my architect friends uh, that uh, already helped to study some of the, um, some of the um, 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 area inside the, for the service specimen. Well, maybe this, this not so good. Maybe this one. This one is use of the um, forensic architecture technology to use some of the existing available image that visualize the internal space. So we can understand um, for the pink portion is the damaged portion um, with the use of this uh, forensic architecture technology. And also uh, another architect friends um, who also uh, do some renderings that uh, shows uh, the internal space. As Shita has mentioned, they have an uh, internal uh, retaining wall built uh, here. And um, what is visualized um, when the retaining wall is um, before the, the internal reinforced wall is built, uh, the space is more spacious. And also some of the questions we have to ask ourselves before we do the design is that, um, because the, currently the Bishop Hill, um, is, uh, there's no electricity supply. Um, before we dis discover the, the facilities, the neighborhood would like to use the, the, the mountain for the, the, hill, the Bishop Hill for the sports activities. Uh, but uh, they, this article said that uh, they wish to have some um, street lighting on the hill. And when we do some of the basic facilities or the basic um, um, use in the, in the heritage sites, uh, can, can we uh, still maintain the whole integrity of the but the whole the whole mountain shape of the site, or we, can we have um we have to concern about lighting ventilation or fire safety or the space um but without um adopting the local um um regulation that treat that as really as a building um, the more when we have the, the uh, portion is demolished here, uh, the debris uh, can we still retain them uh, as part of the history that uh, we have we remember in the later time that uh, at some day uh, we kind of we neglect the, the heritage, but um, um, we kind of uh, at the end uh, save the heritage. So it is also part of the history. Um, but also can um, if we want to have some new adoption, new um, intervention there. So uh, it's. Um, how can we adopt with this heritage site? And also about the management. In the past, um, five years ago, this site, um, why the government um, wished to demolish the area is uh, it's because some of the uh, party over the, the piece of field there, and then uh, it to control properly. And, but um, um, some of the, uh, un uh, control uh, or the over management. If if there's too much management over the place, um, it allows many choose here. Is it still good for the local um, neighborhood? And also about the function of the place, uh, as uh, the local locals, the neighborhood would like to um, um, build their own facilities on this mountain. Uh, if we have some new functions, can they um, uh, different group of people can still share the same place or uh, can um, do, do not disturb with each other and then share the place with harmony. Also, uh, some of the heritage conservation policy we may um, uh, um, have to think about in Hong Kong. In the 1970s, with development, many of the heritage building is demolished. And then in the 2000s, uh, where the Hong Kong citizens is start to uh, aware that, um, and uh, in 2000, 2010, the government have some uh, new measures on the um, um, heritage conservation. But uh, clearly, uh, from nowadays uh, perspective, uh, it seems that the, the local uh, policy and also the, the tools. So um, 
how can we um, uh, change or improve the current uh, local conservation policy in Hong Kong? Um, so as this um, finalized on um, um, uh, my sharing. And I think, I know that uh, she does, because uh, she's uh, been designing uh, the thesis in back in the master study. So uh, she will talk a little bit more on her designs. So I would like to share my design strategies during my studies in the design school to open the discussion towards the future design. I conducted and derived various design options, including to turn this sentence into a com museum, community center, and even art exhibition space, and analyze the effects of the new intervention to the original uh, spatial qualities inside but it is fine that any arch uh, architectural articulations would unavoidably affect the original architectural language. So it's come to the question is, is the, uh, is the intervention inside the reservoir a necessary act? Consider the existing usage and the size of the Bishop Hill. Is it possible to have the uh, supporting facilities and the new program to insert next to the reservoir rather than direct intervention to the original architecture. So in the final design, I adopted a minimal intervention approach to the reservoir to maintain it as an underground structure and keep most of the original uh, columns and the roof. And uh, I proposed to create a small entrance at the summit of the Bishop Hill for easy management and also insert the new progress by modifying um, the earthfield portion and the supporting facilities next to the original retaining wall system so that the reservoir could keep its original interior but still functional. So I hope this sharing could inspire uh, the design directions in the future since the public now would like to preserve the original structure as much as possible now. Is am I sh just sharing about uh, my design before? Okay. So thank you, uh, Sita and um, Mickey, uh, for our first presentation. So, um, so our next speaker um, will be Professor Jim Ko. Um, his topic is water for a new uh, room the aqueducts and um, cisterns of Byzantine uh, Constantinople, uh, Turkey. Professor Jim Kohn, uh, he's a professor of classical archaeology, School of History, Classics and Archaeology um, at, the, at the University of Edinburgh. He has lectured at Warwick and Newcastle University. He has um, directed um, excavation on uh, Hadrian's Wall and he will study the supply of Byzantine uh, Constantinople uh, in Istanbul uh, since the 1990s. His research focuses on the interdisciplinary studies of past cities working alongside engineers and geologists. So Professor Jim Kuo, please. Thank you very much. Um... Right, okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be able to participate in uh, the meeting today, this webinar today. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure on lots of counts, partly because I have, as, as you'll recognize, I have a fascination with urban water supplies um, and the excitement of seeing these early 20th century examples from uh, what were former British colonies, but um, particularly in places like Hong Kong and Sydney. And I'll be talking about Constantinople. Um, Constantinople, of course, is modern Istanbul, and it was previously a much smaller Roman town called Byzantium, 
which is why we talk about Byzantine Constantinople. Um, but the city of Constantinople itself was founded in the fourth century uh, of the Christian era by the Emperor Constantine. And within a century, it became the most important city in the Roman world uh, and continued to be so for another thousand years until the Ottoman takeover in 1453. So this is a long story, potentially, um, a story of urban, uh, really urban creation uh, in what we call the late antique period, in other words, the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries, at a time when many people think of the decline of the Roman Empire. This is not a declining empire at all. Uh, this is a very vibrant, and as you shall see in terms of technology and engineering, an innovative uh, empire. Um, maintaining many of the older traditions of Rome uh, and creating them into, uh, which continue throughout the Middle Ages. So here we can see three images. First of all, the water coming from outside of the city. Uh, the secondly, a reconstruction of one of the great aqueduct bridges. And finally, on the right, um, an image of one of my former colleagues, Professor Paolo Bono from the University of Sapienza in Rome, who was a hydrogeologist. And I think it's the interdisciplinary aspects of the project, which I hope I'll be able to bring out uh, this morning, or this afternoon for most of you, but it's morning in, in Britain. So Constantinople, Istanbul. Uh, it's, it's well known as one of the great cities of the world. Um, it's on the, on the link between Europe and Asia. Um, it's surrounded by water. Uh, unlike old Rome, which had a river, uh, Constantinople had sea. Uh, and I think that's one of the interesting comparisons that we can make with places like Sydney and with Hong Kong. And although Constantinople was, of course, an imperial city, um, it was also a great trading center and a great maritime city. Um, and here we can see on this slide its situation with the Black Sea to the north, the Sea of Marmara to the south, the line of the, the Bosphorus, which you can see running from the Black Sea through and the city down here. Um, and I show two images from the city. First of all, the great church of Hagia Sophia, uh, later the Ottoman mosque of Hagia Sophia. And on the top right, just to remind us of the presence of water. Water is all around the city. But of course, water is also a challenge for a great city if that water is largely seawater. This is a challenge which Hong Kong faces, particularly Hong Kong Island. Um, and, you know, it's OK having water, but you need drinking water for, for, for great urban settings. Now, we know that the Romans, we've seen already some examples of Roman engineering in terms of their ability to create arches. And we shall see another uh, further examples of that when we look at the examples from Constantinople itself. Um, but this is, of course, the, the largest of the surviving Roman aqueduct bridges from the south of France at the Pont du Gard near the town of Nîmes. This was a massive undertaking and brought water, as we've heard from Nikki, using graviten, gravita, gra gravity from distant springs uh, towards the city itself. Uh, and this is a common feature around the Mediterranean. Um, these great arch bridges, Spain, France, Italy, all North Africa, they're all examples of Roman aqueduct bridges. And, in, and significantly, with the new city of Constantine in the fourth century, uh, we see the creation of a very ex extended network of such bridges in order to bring water into the city. Now, this is the uh, the situation, uh, the landward situation to the west. We have the, the, the line of the Bosphorus down here and the Sea of Marmara. Um, and this is a map which simply shows the extended line of all the aqueduct channels. We saw one initially in which uh, Paolo Bono was standing in, these long channels which extend a huge distance to the west of the city. And so what we're looking at then is a massive infrastructure program in order to provide water for the city of Constantinople. And the history of, it's, it's interesting to reflect on the history of research. 
whereas the the systems the type you have at bishop's hill the systems within the city have been known have been known since byzantine times are recorded in byzantine times and also in ottoman times the system of channels and bridges which goes outside of the city has really only been properly understood at the end of the 20th century uh, and the major undertaking was uh, a Turkish professor, Professor Kazim Chechen of Istanbul Technical University, who, who wrote a book with absolutely the right name, which called it The Longest Roman Water Supply Line. Um, fortunately, my colleagues and I were working in the same area um, in, to the west of Istanbul in the 1990s, and we took on a, a much more detailed archaeological um, survey of the line of the aqueducts. And this was published in this book, The Water Supply of Byzantine Constantinople. And on the left, you can see some of my colleagues from Istanbul Technical University in a project we had in uh, about 15 to 20 years ago with Professor Daria Magtaf. So lots of research, and I'll say a little bit about the, the difficulties of the terrain, which where these great bridges and these, these monuments survive. And then subsequently, um, we've been involved in a, a, more, a more recent project with uh, Professor Martin Crapper, uh, um, Dr. Simon Smith, uh, Snyder Ward and Francesca Ruggieri uh, at Edinburgh University, um, more recently, uh, looking at the combination of applying engineering methodologies for understanding the Byzantine water system. Now, what you've been I mean, I think what, uh, what interested um, Dr. Wong when she contacted me was the, um, the similarity, the potential similarity with some of the great urban systems within the city of Constantinople, in particular, the Yerabatansarai, the basilica system, which lies within the very heart of the city. And here you can see a photograph of it here with uh, water, and you'll see the, 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 the structure of the of, of the roof. Uh, we saw the example from Bishop Hill, um, and here you can see the, the similarities. Uh, the piers, the pillars, the, the, the supports for the roof are effectively columns. And this is something um, almost unique to Constantinople. The Romans had constructed systems before, although none were of a scale which were to be found in Constantinople either in the fifth and sixth century or even later on. Um, so a very, a very new uh, approach. And also we heard from Nikki when he was talking and, and Sheeta was the use of local resources. Um, and here uh, we see the use of columns. Normally these columns would be used for along the line of streets or as the facades of buildings. Um, but within the Sea of Marmara, there's a huge quarry of marble, um, which was used to make marble columns. And this, uh, these were used then for the supports for the aqueducts within the city. Later on, many of these columns were reused from, um, from earlier buildings. But initially, many of the columns were actually just made simply uh, to be used within the aqueducts. Now, there's a sort of romance, particularly about the basilica system, the Yerobatansarai, and this is a 19th century view, although I think you'll recognize that there's a certain amount of um, artistic li li liberty here, insofar that the spaces between the piers is much greater than we saw in the previous image and the one I'm gonna show you next. This of course is also the scene uh, of, a, of, of a sort of iconic moment in From Russia With Love, one of the, I think, the earliest and the best James Bond films, uh, when Bond is taken across, rather like this view here, and I think this view actually influenced the, 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 the artistic directors of the film. Um, they, they sailed, they floated across in order to take um, an entirely mistaken view of the interior of the Russian embassy. That's actually what the interior of the Yerobatansarai looks like now. And that's our team uh, making one of their initial visits uh, just to be familiar with the city of Constantinople uh, and its remains. So within Istanbul then, there are a, a very large number of surviving 
uh, relics belonging to the Byzantine past. Um, and but the majority, the, the largest single type of monument which survives are systems. And there are 211, which our most recent our most recent study was able to, to demonstrate. This is a topographical map showing the situation of the old city. Um, the earliest city of Byzantium was at the right-hand end of the peninsula towards the east, overlooking the Bosphorus. Uh, this was uh, originally a Greek colony and then a Roman city, but a modest size, nothing very large. It was probably no larger than Pompeii in Italy. Um, but under Constantine, the city was expanded. It was expanded to the west. Um, obviously, just like that, in much the same way that the British were able to take more territories in order to gain more ground in Kowloon. Uh, so Constantine extended the city to the west and then later it was extended further with a massive set of fortification walls along here. So it's within this area that all these 211 systems survive. But you can also recognize from this plan the topography of that city, a series of hills, not quite as steep as as, as, as the peak in Hong Kong, but still pretty steep hills around the city. And in order to provide water um, for these higher areas, remember it comes by gravity from outside, it was necessary for, to find new sources of water at a higher elevation. And that's what the, the next slide will show you. So these were the new water sources uh, that were, uh, which were tapped over the fourth and the fifth century. So between the 350s up until the, the 450s, this enormously long system of aqueducts and, and channels was constructed, nearly 500 kilometers in total length. Um, and this is a new plan produced by some geological colleagues of mine uh, for a new, uh, new publication in geoarchaeology, which is concerned with aspects of the carbonates within the system. So there you can see the lines of the channels. Um, and here you can see how this system emerged over time. Initially, there was a small aqueduct of Hadrian. Then there was a, uh, the, 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 the fourth century aqueduct constructed for the new city that then was extended. And then later on, in, interestingly, that system failed. It was actually almost impossible to sustain this rather elderly, um, possibly over, uh, engineered system which had existed, but there was also always the problem of earthquakes and maintenance in an increasingly impoverished empire. And it was uh, later on when the Ottomans took over in 1453, that the Ottomans themselves actually uh, mainly used the systems much closer to the city, because as we shall see, they had a different way of storing water. So the water traveled through channels, channels which were covered and which were lined with mortar. So the mortar constructed channels. And this is the sort of countryside it, it crossed through. Um, and in the distance here, you can see a bridge, which I'll show you uh, in a couple of slides time, which is the largest of the aqueduct bridges. This slide, based on a, a GIS visualization by Francesco Ruggeri, um, shows you how the channels made their way around the hillside because essentially there's a slight um, decline. So gravity is sending the water from its distant places to the west, bringing it to most, much closer towards the city center uh, in Constantinople. And in some places where it was necessary to cross over valleys, there was the necessary construction of great bridges. Not quite as big as the Pont du Gard, but almost. This bridge itself is actually nearly 40 meters high, but it's difficult to recognize the grandeur of it because of the forest setting. But at the same time, I think the forest setting, it's an area which is, even though it's so close to such a large city of more than 50 million pe people, at the same time, uh, the forest setting has ensured the survival um, of the remains. And it's, this is a, an interesting, again, a reflection to what you can think about in terms of of, of your example from Bishop's Hill. So this is a, um, a, a sort of a bar diagram, which in a sense, it's a bit like the history of the city through water, um, because it was designed by um, a postdoc of mine, um, Riley Snyder. And so what he designed is the length of the channels 
for the Roman aqueduct for under the Byzantines, the initial one, how it was extended, how after a catastrophe in the early seventh century, after a siege, it was broken and not restored, how it was restored. So in a sense, you can see the sort of the roller coaster demographics of the city as the city declined and then it, 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 it improved again. Now, Riley Snyder, as part of his doctoral research, was able to estimate the amount of building materials. We talked about, um, Nikki was talking about building materials, and Sheeta was talking about building materials, the use of concrete, the use of cement, the use of brick, and so forth. Um, well, Riley was able to estimate the amounts of mortar which was used for the construction, not of the bridges, but of the channels, the channel that we saw, uh, and using the module of the Olympic swimming pool in terms of volume, in other words, 250, sorry, uh, 2,500 square meters, he was able to estimate that to construct that 500 kilometers, nearly 500 kilometers of channels, it was necessary to have this many Olympic swimming pools full of mortar. So it's astonishing. It's a, we, we, you know, we, we can't go back to the archives to find out what the actual cost of this system was, but we can estimate the amounts of materials to get some idea of it. If we get closer to the city now, here you can see on the left, this is the, the system known as the Forest of Belgrade. This was the area that was mainly used for the Ottoman aqueducts, and in fact so, served the city into the 19th century until uh, there was a more extensive line um, um, ad advanced. And here you can see how different, different lines of channels at different elevations were able to feed different parts of the city. So this is a distribution within the city of systems, the sort of systems that um, I was talking about, like the Yerubatan Sarai. And the, uh, that's the Yerubatan Sarai, the Basilica system. And this is another one uh, also towards the eastern end of the peninsula, but a higher elevation. This is the system known as the Thousand and One Columns or the Bimbi Direct. Um, the study of the systems uh, was part of um, a regional there have been a number of studies, and um, and I should acknowledge, and I'll show a slide in a minute, um, of Dr. Karim Erim, of, of sorry, of Dr. Karim Altu of um, Istanbul Municipality. He works uh, as a conservation officer for the municipality, um, and he has his responsibility is a range of buildings. But he uh, he carried he carried out a thesis at Istanbul Technical University studying these systems, and he is he's the sort of person who faces the challenges that you face in Hong Kong and in any great city of modern developments and how to try to retain those components of the older city. So I'm very grateful to, for Dr. Altu for sharing his evidence from our previous project. Now, what we can see within the city that there were a large number of covered systems, just like the Basilica system there, but also there were a significant number of three major open reservoirs in the zone between the, the major walls to the west and an earlier wall line here. This is a zone of the city that was never as fully um, occupied um, in terms of um, density of housing as the area to the east. And here we can see quite extraordinary large um, structures which are now uh, reused. And this is an interesting, these are great huge basically huge holes which were excavated uh, in the western part of uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, and which continued to be left open uh, into modern times. Uh, the one at the top, which was known as the Reservoir of Aetius, constructed in the later fifth century, is now a football stadium, which is a reflection of its size. Uh, and the one below, which is the Reservoir of Aspar, um, is now used as a protected children's play area in a very crowded city. Now the approximate size of these, these are significantly larger than the, the Bishop's Hill example, for instance. These are around about a quarter of a million cubic meters full capacity. Um, and interestingly enough, um, in Southeast London, only three and a half miles from the center of the London in the city, uh, at about the same time that the Bishop's Hill uh, Reservoir was being constructed, um, there was a massive uh, 
excavation into the London clay um, to create a huge reservoir, which was subsequently covered over. And this is the Honor Oak Reservoir. Um, you can see on the bottom left, something which I think will be quite familiar to you from um, the images we saw from Bishop Hill, Bishop's Hill. On the right, you can see a view of the interior. Presumably this was the opening ceremony. Um, and you can see a big difference between Bishop Hill and uh, the Honor Oak. Honor Oak, the building materials were brick, whereas Bishop Hill, you have that splendid granite. So um, in Bishop Hill, you can actually have these, these because granite has a much, sort of, uh, you know, structurally is much stronger than brick. Um, it's possible to have these, these elegant, uh, piers, which you find in Bishop's Hill, much closer to the Byzantine example, where you have these single or multiple shafts and columns. But here you have these rather larger um, supports, but basically, basically the same uh, idea. A great covered space, although it's, it's five times, more than five times as big, but on top of it in London is a nine hole golf course. And I actually know about this, not because I have any great, um, you know, I'm not a, a, an industrial, uh, industrial archaeologist. Um, my son, uh, one of my sons who lives in London actually plays golf there and he told me about it. Um, but it's, I think, a very interesting comparison, almost contemporary with the example that you have in Kowloon. So then briefly then to carry on uh, to, with the examples from uh, Constantinople. Um, there's a, as I say, there's a 211 systems known across the, the old city, the old peninsula. They range inside from the Yerbatan and the Bimbir Direk, which I show you on the right. Uh, another example, which is sometimes known as the Theodosian, uh, um, the Theodosian uh, um, system, which you can see bottom left. And this one I think is particularly interesting because it shows you the sort of care and attention which the Byzantine builders, not simply in terms of the roofing and the vaulting in brickwork, but also the use of, of capitals. Remember, this was a space that was never to be really seen. Um, and this actually is a feature of late Victorian and early Edwardian uh, engineering, certainly in Britain and also across much of Europe, is the sort of the detailing, the architectural detailing that we find in what are essentially utilitarian structures. It's not a feature that we find so much in the modern, in the contemporary 21st century world. And at the top, you know, many of these systems or some of these systems are quite large, the Yerubatan is enormous. It's not as big as the open ones, but it's almost as big as those. And yet at the same time, most of them are much smaller. Some of them are really quite small. And this one you can see at the top left has been converted into a, um, into a, into a sort of restaurant. And so it's also this, this question of uses of, of these monuments. But this is, um, uh, and I'd like to thank Dr. Eri, uh, Dr. Altu for this example. This was um, a reconstruction of the, the largest of the systems, the Yerabatansarai, demonstrating how it was within an urban space. And basically, there was a pre existing building which had a very large courtyard. And so they simply dug into that courtyard and created a new water reservoir there, in much the same way that in many towns uh, where spaces at a premium, you will create underground car parks in open, court, uh, open courtyards and squares. We find this all across Europe uh, in order to cope with the problem of, of car parking. Um, the Yerabatansarai fortunately had a, a large, in terms of area, quite a large space, whereas the Bimbia Derek, which is this example, which you can see here, um, it needed a, was a, a much reduced footprint, therefore it's much taller. Um, and I think this much be, this is actually closer to the example you have in Hong Kong, and you can see these these great double double columns. And in practice, when you go and look at this today, um, it's it's been excavated to this point and no further. Um, so if you go into it, so this view here, which you can see, is there. You can see that. So there's all that still remains unexcavated. Interestingly enough. When you compare this, the Binbir direct, to the Yerubatansarai, the Yerubatansarai is a great tourist attraction. Um, it's constantly filled with people. Um, or most of the other systems are not quite so busy. And one of the problems, just as you, as, as Shita was discussing, is how 
systems and these, these earlier structures can be used uh, in order to be able to contribute towards the role of the, the, the life of the modern city. So finally, I'd just like to um, basically ask a few questions and then make a couple of comments. So what's the role of the Byzantine systems? Um, in, the, in the past, they were crucial in order to provide the water security for, for a city, which at times was at under threat from external aggressors, but also uh, to provide water security and sufficient water for a city where the, um, it, which didn't have a significant water supply within itself. There was no river and the groundwater is very restricted. There are no significant wells. Um, so the system is a unique, almost unique um, response. The, the only other uh, Mediterranean city which has as extensive systems as Istanbul, Constantinople was Alexandria. Uh, and those date mainly from a slightly later period in the, in the medieval Islamic city. So what do these spaces contribute to the city's historic and its contemporary environment? As I've mentioned, some are used as tourist attractions. Some are used, for instance, as wedding venues. There's a whole range of them. And, and I think Istanbul is an interesting example, both of successes, but also failures. Sometimes these buildings are restored, but then people sort of scratch their heads and say, what are we gonna do with them in the future? Um, do these structures hold lessons for us in the future? Um, are they important as reminders for our concern for the long-term environment? And I'll finish with this image, which I find, this is a reconstruction by Typhoon On Air. Uh, and if any of you want to see images of how Constantinople might have appeared, do visit the so-called Byzantium 1200 website, just Google it and it'll come up. This is uh, actually the interior of a, of, of a medieval system. So the others were built in the fifth, sixth century. This was probably built in the 10th or 11th. Um, so these are just some comments that I'd like to finish with. Um, they represent a significant and ongoing in public investment of the imperial state. And they also reflect the engineering expertise, expertise in water provision and conservation over a long period of time for one of the world's great cities, that's Constantinople. They also remind us that Constantinople had a great deal more to it than simply as a sort of great center of religious and religious learning as, as it has been characterized in the past. Um, they can, can demonstrate how the past can be a present, if not an obvious element in our daily lives in a historic environment. I mean, the, 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 the numbers of systems all around, the, the fact that, you know, you go into people's houses, into shops, and then they say, oh, there's a system down here. So the past is a presence. Uh, and the system is actually a really uh, important contribution to, 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 to creating that notion. And for Istanbul, they're a reminder of a forgotten secret marginal and sometimes hazardous underworld. Um, but it can stimulate our imagination. Uh, but it also meets the contemporary environmental challenges and reminds us of the environmental challenges which face modern urban life. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, uh, thank you, yes. Thank you, Jim, for your very fantastic presentation. So uh, right now we will go into our Q&A session and I believe that uh, uh, our speaker can also see a uh, uh, few questions. I also type my own question. So actually you can also, uh, other speakers, if you would like to uh, raise your question, um, welcome. So uh, let us see, um, read um, the box inside. Oops. Okay, so yeah. One second. Yes, one is sticking. Okay, sorry. Let me see how can I. Yes, now in the yes now in the gallery mode. Yeah, thank you, Wa. So uh, so for the first question is from uh, Lisa Lee. Uh, she is uh. Thank, I try to read her work. Uh, wow, it's quite difficult. I, I think this, uh, Lisa, thank you for your question, but I believe this question can be answered in our discussion part. Yes. Uh, 
but uh, and other question, uh, Errol Sun is quite long. I, I try to read it and uh, maybe uh, all our speakers may also, if you have any comments, you can also answer it. And, and at this time, I would like to um, uh, introduce our other two speaker, um, Mr. Stephen Collus. Um, uh, he's the manager of the Roman Baths and Pump Room uh, from Bath UK and also uh, Professor Tim Greer. Uh, he's a adjunct uh, professor from the School of Architect, Design, and Planning from City University. Um, so yes, here here we go. So um, from Elson, um, he or she has some thoughts. Uh, see if any speaker wants to comment upon. It is often the architectural aesthetics that is most appealing to the public, but. Uh, storytelling and the storytelling of how the site matters to us is perhaps the most important things when it comes to uh, conservation, especially when we are talking about this fairy water work that involves water, water as an essential of human life and closely linked to the deve development of public health and uh, urbanization in the Kowloon area. In Hong Kong, there has been a lot of experience of preserving historic waterworks for public use, for hiking trails along the reservoirs to uh, recreational uh, grounds like the uh, Wang Ning Chong Park, and I suppose turning the Bishop Hill structure for recreational use. But I do find the storytelling elements is rather lacking in the uh, exciting waterworks um, turning recreation places, however well preserved they are. Yeah. So you can also see the question um, in the Q and A box. So any thoughts? Uh, uh, I may yes. uh, talk a bit yes. more on that. Uh, yeah. yeah, because um, yeah, because I'm of course I'm an architect in Hong Kong, and of course for architect we um very um um experience on the um, architectural aesthetics or what is uh, what style or what um uh, techno technology technique that has built the heritage but for me um uh, because i'm also the, the um, uh, facebook page i found the heritage exploration for hong kong i for me i wish to um um elevate um the the or, or kind of uh, the story behind a uh, niche heritage for so example um um, in, in the past, maybe uh, when we know that um, the Kowloon Reservoir is already um, preserved as a declared monument, but um, um, for for all, for us, we just think that oh, maybe the water uh, just supply from the reservoir directly into our house. Uh, but um, we after we discover this um, the um, underground uh, water service uh, water reservoir in Bishop Hills, uh, we, we we try to we need to understand more about the whole distribution system. I think that uh, yeah, uh, this um, um, heritage discovery can help us to um, know more about the, the story of um, the heritage behind. And I think it's, it's also important that um, the, the, the authorities um, share this kind of uh, the stories or the principle behind uh, in the heritage so that um, we can know um, more of the stories behind. Yes, thank you, uh, Nikki. So what about Jim? Yeah, I was going to say that um, my uh, a friend of mine, uh, Caroline Finkel, who uh, lived a long, long time in, she's not living in Istanbul at present, but uh, she, she's very interested in, in developing walking trails um, and what, uh, um, particularly walking trails for people who can not necessarily reliant on cars so they can get public transport and then walk outside the city because, you know, a, a city of 15 million, you know, you need a bit of air sometimes and um, or fresh air. And, and so Caroline is actually, I, I, I'm not sure the book is completed, but she's actually published a book, which will be in English and Turkish, um, to, to talking about net trails with their histories. And the history includes, obviously, those water channels running out of the city, um, and both for the Byzantine period and for the Ottoman period. Because outside of the city, the, the water infrastructures are actually really important just as they can be for any great city and they can they do tell a story of of how the city extends beyond its boundaries at all times so i think that's very important yeah mm -hmm. and the notion of story i think i'm i'm I, i'm not sure how far um my colleague kerry maltu 
um, he he does tours of the aqueducts, which I know of of the cisterns in Istanbul, which I think are pretty well attended. But at the same time, I think there's great scope for more of that within the city of Istanbul as a way of talking about the city's past rather than just thinking about its great monuments. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So uh, what about Shita? <laughs> yeah, I think I mentioned about is it about the size and the area of the Bishop Hill. Uh, I do agree that uh, um, there is a need to respond to the local public space um, requirements because uh, the local would like to use it continuously for the recreational uses. But there are many opportunities to turn the Bishop Hill Mountain, not just a recreational uh, place, but also a storytelling museum so that uh, both criteria and the, the expectation of the local community could be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shita. So Stephen, you are the expert of public engagement. So do you have anything to say? <laughs> Um, well, uh, I'm a practitioner. I don't know how much expertise I have, really, but um, the, uh, uh, with um, uh, public engagement, it, um, um, museums are places that tell stories. And uh, I work in a museum uh, that is also uh, a remarkable archaeological site. Um, there are a tremendous number of stories you can usually build about almost anything. Um, uh, it, in a museum, it's about the mobile artifacts. Uh, on uh, an ancient site, it's about the built structures. Uh, but it's not just about those. Um, it can be about the people who uh, are involved with them in the past. Um, uh, the people who are involved with them today. Um, it can be about uh, the impact of these structures uh, on uh, society. Um, and uh, uh, there's almost no limit to the potential number of stories you can tell. Uh, there's a great story here just about the discovery of the site. Uh, it was only built just over 100 years ago. Um, it's in that time, they managed to almost lose it. Uh, and rediscover it. Um, it's quite astonishing, really. Um, but um, the, uh, but, but it, you know, there is precedent for this. Um, the, uh, the, the site I manage at the Roman Baths uh, was lost to view. Um, we're not quite sure when, but it uh, must have fallen into a state of incred incredible uh, decrepitude. Um, at uh, some point and uh, was completely lost to view um, and was only rediscovered really in the 1880s, uh, which today people find quite amazing. It's only, uh, what, 140 years ago. Uh, I've been managing it for 30 of those. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, these things uh, do come to light and uh, the story of the discovery of the Roman Bars is a fascinating story that uh, I've um, uh, traded on very well for many years by giving loads of lectures to local people who are always fascinated by the story. Um, and so there's all kinds of aspects I think you can often pick up on uh, with uh, these uh, ancient monuments like this. And uh, it's got something about it that's uh, actually great, uh, which is water. Uh, it's something that everybody connects with. We all use water every day in some way, um, whether we bathe in it or drink it or whatever we do with it. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, so everyone can find a way of connecting to it. That's not true of everything. Uh, that uh, you see in museums, some things are very difficult for people to connect to. But th that is the good thing that this has got, um, which uh, is very much in its favour, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. I agree that uh, the most amazing story actually is the discovery of this site. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting story for that. So what about Tim? Um, I think uh, architectural aesthetic. I think you 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 have uh, many experience on talking about that. Well, I, I think the thing that's fascinating about these sorts of pieces of infrastructure is, um, I, I guess, when they they're layered up with um, 
contemporary uses, clearly a lot of these reservoirs, and we, we saw really interestingly in Jim's talk how they became soccer fields and play areas. It's, it's actually, to me, the big question is, do you make a museum and encapsulate it and just talk about its path, or do you actually pull it into a new thriving city? And, and clearly the, the really interesting thing about Kowloon is that um, there's, lots of, there's lots of urban pressures for that piece of land, hence its demolition in the first place. So what, what do you then do with it in the future? And, you know, we can start to look at that from a very uh, pragmatic point of view through a need, but we can also look at it at a very, um, uh, I guess, um, uh, well, almost ethereal way or a um, aesthetic way. And, and what happens when you have something that's very old and then you have something, then you have this new need. What, what is this third thing that happens in, in the middle? And how can we sort of manipulate that to create something that's exceedingly engaging? And I guess that, that'll sort of be the backbone of my Paddington Reservoir Garden talk. So for me, it's, it's actually, it, it is very much about, it's about the future. How do you project a future? Now, a future may be, um, a, a, a museum, but I think the thing that's very interesting about this uh, this infrastructure is that, again, Jim touched on it, that the amount of effort and embellishment that went into these structures, they were not um, pragmatic uh, things that were knocked up at the end of the, the um, you know, in the late 2000s when um, the project manager trilogy of speed um, you know, speed, cost, and efficiency were the, were the goal. There, there was there were much greater values, and we can see that when we can go back into them, and when, and they do become a very important part, of, I think, of our sustainability stories because we can say these structures have been here in in the the Ottoman examples for the, you know more than a thousand years. I mean, to me, that gets the big tick of sustainability. Not that you got a certain. Um, collection of semantic points for green star ratings, et cetera. There's been this enduring quality. And in that enduring quality, we have true sustainability, but it also holds a mirror up to how we, we build today. And, and I think we really do need to look at what we're doing. Thank you, team. Um, okay, um, so our um, next question by uh, Chris Chen. Chris Chen, I, I think this question may be Nikki and Shita know more about that. Why did this site in Hong Kong remain relatively unknown until the past week or two? Are there other potential sites in Hong Kong that are also unknown but of potential value collected to this recent uncovered site? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I, I hope the public could understand it is the design of the water facilities have to be confidential um, due to the safety concern in the past. When it is terminated, it will become very easy to be forgotten. Um, I think uh, the reply from the government is very clear that there are still four um, similar structure and heritage in Hong Kong. Um, so I think uh, uh, at, the same, uh, at the time, uh, we wait for the government to release more information about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, for, for me, I think that um, because of course, Hong Kong have a long history um, um, for more than 150 years of history, but um, um, for different kind of reasons, um, um, uh, for local citizens, um, we, um, uh, in the past or, or even the government, they may not um, um, we will learn too much um, or, or write too much history on, on the on the textbooks or, or some of the uh, maybe some basic um, um, background may, may be shown but um, um, for now are days um, while uh, the local citizens are getting more and more concerned want to know more about the cities in the past um, um, they may they may want to uh, review more that, that is also reflect in this today's case uh, where uh, actually um, the uh, even some uh, reporters may ask uh, um, some of the heritage may be um, demolished uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the, the underground cisterns is already demolished 10 years ago. So uh, asking uh, what, what do I feel about that? Um, I think that um, um, for the past, um, maybe um, uh, compared to nowadays, it's already um, like um, even if just 10 years time, the local cities are getting more and more um, uh, 
aware on the uh, on the heritage. And even I think I, with the help of some, uh, internet, uh, people can um, have uh, the the knowledge are uh, very uh, well spread. So um, I think it's more about um, the challenge uh, we are facing um, uh, in the future that uh, how can we uh, improve our um, uh, heritage um, awareness and also the government departments, how can they, um, um, uh, if there's still some more of the heritage, how can they protect them properly uh, instead of um, demolish um, uh, without uh, being known by the citizens? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Nikki. So another question, I think maybe for uh, Jim, uh, by M. Lee. Um, Many thanks for all presentations, and I would like to know more about the conservation of the aqueducts and cisterns in Constantinople. So are they mainly driven by the government and the professions uh, due to their um, tourism and economic uh, potential? Any opportunities uh, for the community to take part in it, or do locals really raise much concern about that? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I can't... In terms of the aqueducts outside of the um, the city, um, there has been in practice. It's a it's a quite sparse, as I mentioned before. Although it's close to the city, it's a quite sparsely populated area, uh, and there is there is virtually no conservation. There is no conservation, um, and there is some there are some problems of of damage. But um, so so those are the, the these are the aqueduct bridges and so forth outside of the city. Within the city, it's largely um, it's a municipal uh, initiatives, although there have been some private initiatives because obviously people actually own these structures um, and private initiatives. But they've not always, as I as I mentioned at the um, the Bimbi Direct, which is very close to the center um, of the of the Blue Mosque and so on. Um, that was a, there was a. a I, I wouldn't say it was a proper conservation program, but there was a sort of conservation program and it became open, but they couldn't find a proper role for it. Uh, so that was a commercial uh, enterprise. And there's lots of commercial attempts to try and use these structures. When they're small, they can be readily used as restaurants and so forth. And they're obviously, they fit into a sort of, you know, it's a good touristic ambiance, if you like. You know, one of them, for instance, is a nightclub or used to be a nightclub. Another one uh, is used as the as the uh, as the entrance, the lobby of a hotel. And there's also and they're, they're fascinating. And there's a there's a whole study about the contemporary use of these these systems, which I haven't done. Um, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, it, that's up to some sort of smart architecture student in Istanbul to do. Um, but the, but it is a challenge and it is also a challenge in terms of conservation and the problem is with a city uh, such a large city and uh, it's, it's a, a very dynamic place like Hong Kong um, it's trying to get the balance right and the extent of which the sort of government or the mis municipality resources are prepared to be dedicated to something which is for the most part invisible um, and that's the real challenge isn't it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Jim, uh, I actually I want to ask you two uh, questions related to archaeology. So the first question uh, is there any specific meaning for the term cistern in Byzantine archaeology? What are the major differences between uh, cistern and reservoir in water supply uh, management? And the second question is uh, about the water pines because we also find the water pines in this underground uh, reservoir. So uh, compare with um, the one you study in uh, Constantinople, uh, what kind of material they use on making the water pines uh, and how did they uh, link up together in the city? Right, cisterns. Cistern, I think, is, is, it tends to be used for structures, not invariably, but tends to be used for, for structures which are covered. Um, and of course, so may, uh, the majority of the 200 or are, are, are covered and they're sort of under the ground. Um, so reservoir, I think, is better used for, it can be, I think it's better used for the open examples. Um, but I, I don't know, but Tim as an architect may have a, a more specific response to this. Um, and I've worked with uh, water engineers and they don't seem to be particularly troubled by the difference between a reservoir and uh, a system. Um, and I think it, it can be, they, they can be used synonymously, but not, uh, you know, you just have to be careful what you're saying. In terms of pipes and channels, um, as we saw, the 
the main water channel coming from the countryside was a very large channel, although it was never full to full capacity. And it varied very significantly throughout the year in terms of the amount of water that was being delivered through it, which is why it was so large. Um, within the city, um, and it's much less well documented than other places, um, but within Constantinople, within Istanbul itself, excavations have revealed uh, large terracotta pipes, but also stone pipes, which are actually made from big blocks of stone, um, which is a huge task. But that reflects the, um, the, the, the pressure of the water that there must have been within those. So if you have stone pipes, you're expecting a very water under very high pressure. And we know this from elsewhere in the Roman world. Um, so um, there's a wonderful photograph of, of excavations in the of road, road excavations, road works in the 1960s, which shows a whole series of these stone water pipes underneath some of the main streets in, in, in Istanbul. So it's under there, but it's just a problem of trying to document it. So there's lots of, there are bits of piping, but not. Interestingly enough, in the Western part of the Roman world, they use lead pipes. And for instance, Stephen has that in, the, in Bath. But in the Eastern part of the Roman Empire, lead was very, very rarely used. It was mainly terracotta, ceramic, or stone pipes. Thank you. Yeah. So Tim, do you know any difference between, because can we uh, interchangeable on using cistern or vesifer or is, is almost the same for these two terms? Yes, I, th I think the word, well, we just commonly use the word reservoir. And it was interesting when we were working on the Paddington Reservoir Gardens, uh, I realized that we, our offices were on Reservoir Street. And of course, if you follow the street up to the top, it was another one of these reservoirs. But of course, it's totally hidden because they weren't really that keen on letting their whereabouts known. Um, I, I have to confess that um, I was brought up to believe that the cistern was the thing that sat on top of the lavatory. Um, so yes, I can't really contribute much to the, um, to the accuracy of the conversation, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. So uh, because the time is running out, so uh, right now we'll be our uh, break for 10 minutes and then uh, after the break, we will have our part two. So uh, in our part two, we will have an, uh, our uh, two speakers. The first speakers um, will be um, Mr. Stephen uh, uh, Kudos. He will talk about uh, the case on the woman bars. And um, our last speaker will be uh, Tim Greer. Uh, he will talk about the Paddington Reservoir uh, Garden. So let's have a break until um, uh, 6.35, 6.35 Hong Kong time and uh, 10.35 London and Edinburgh time and uh, 9.35 p.m. Uh, so time. welcome back to our part now. two. Uh, in this part, we will have another two speaker um, sharing um, um, their research and also their experience. Um, the first speaker is uh, Mr. Stephen Kulos. Um, his topic is history and public engagement programs in the Women Bath Bath. Mr. Uh, Stephen Kulos is the manager of the Women Bath and Pump Room Bath UK. He has managed the women baths at Bath for more than 30 years. He has a background in field archaeology and museums and is interested in developing interpretation and the art of balancing the needs of visitors, conservation and commercial development. He is a trustee of several heritage organizations. So uh, Stephen, please, you, you can share um, your PowerPoint slide now. Okay. Can you see this? Uh, not yet. Please uh, not yet. press the okay. share um, share button, okay. share screen button. There we are. Yes. You can see it now. Good. Yes. And um, uh, yeah. There we are. So, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to take part in this seminar. I've really enjoyed the presentation so far. Um, 
it's uh, it's really a fascinating thing, uh, the discovery at Bishop's Hill. Um, and uh, uh, it uh, makes me uh, think back to the story of the discovery of the Roman baths itself, um, uh, which uh, basically took place around 1879 and 18, uh, quite by chance. Um, and uh, it was uh, uh, made when um, uh, the local city engineer was um, carrying out some repair works around the hot spring in Bath. Um, and in the course of that, uh, dropped some exploratory holes in and hit lead at depth. Um, it just happened to be the uh, local branch secretary of the Society of Antiquaries and was aware of uh, some stray Roman discoveries that had been made uh, uh, in previous years. Um, and putting two and two together, realised that he was standing in the bottom of a Roman bath. Um, uh, the, uh, the result of that was that um, uh, after some time was that a number of surrounding buildings were demolished to re reveal the Roman baths that we see today. And the council opened them as um, uh, uh, what it hoped would be a money spinning tourist attraction. Um, <laughs> So uh, there are some similarities, but um, the, uh, my, my theme uh, today is really to do with uh, public engagement and uh, the ways in which people are engaged on the site. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, if we uh, just go to this image, this will just explain where it is. Um, if you can see my cursor, I'm, I'm moving it around a large block. Uh, which is uh, the, the obvious street manifestation of the buildings uh, uh, that you would encounter if you were going to visit the Roman baths. You can in fact see uh, the largest of the baths here, uh, but you can't actually see anything else uh, on there that suggests that there's anything Roman or anything really to do with baths at all. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, you, you see the entrance you'd be presented with on uh, approaching it. It's rather grand, of course, um, uh, but uh, apart from the words Roman baths uh, uh, inscribed on the stone above the door, you wouldn't really know that there was anything Roman here. Um, and, put it... and whoops. I seem to have a frozen screen uh, for some reason. I don't know why that is. Um, ah, there we go. Um, <clears throat> the <clears throat> but uh, uh, when you uh, uh, go inside. This is perhaps the image that most people are uh, familiar with of the Roman baths. Uh, a large pool, uh, rather green because of the effects of sunlight and uh, uh, the very rich min mineral content of the spa water in the largest of the, uh, the baths. Uh, but um, uh, in fact, when you look at uh, this image, uh, you can see uh, the red line which uh, demarcates the extent of the archaeological site. And as you can see, it's far greater than uh, it appears on the surface. Um, and uh, uh, the Great Bath there is uh, sort of slightly reminiscent of the hole that you can now see at uh, Bishop's Hill. Uh, it's just an entrepot to a much larger system underground. Um, uh, the other significant thing uh, within this drawing is the yellow line, uh, which is around the spring itself, the hot spring at the source of the site. And uh, uh, as the water comes up naturally hot out of the ground, there is, of course, no, no re reason to have a reservoir or a system uh, to service the Roman baths at Bath. Uh, they rely on this uh, underground source. Um, uh, the uh, cold water would have been used in the bars and there probably was just uh, uh, a very local uh, system of bringing water from nearby springs uh, to the site, but uh, no massive aqueducts such as uh, we uh, saw uh, near uh, Istanbul. 
Um, to explain what you're looking at there, that is the same uh, red line uh, around the uh, what we uh, believe to have been uh, uh, the extent of the Roman settlement uh, at Bath. And uh, as you can see, within that walled area, the archaeological site of the Baths and Temple complex uh, does dominate the entire space. And uh, it's quite likely that many of the uh, other buildings you see there uh, would have been supporting uh, the, or uh, entirely dependent on in some way, the activities taking place within the bathing establishment and visitors attending the temple and so on. Um, uh, Bath is actually quite a small Roman town. Um, and uh, within that same wall that you see there, we know that the medieval population of the city was about 3,000. Um, so uh, the, the Roman population was uh, probably, if anything, a little less than that. Um, and uh, so not one of the biggest cities in Roman Britain by any means, uh, but uh, nevertheless a significant city because uh, uh, of its exceptional but public buildings and architecture uh, driven by the presence of the hot springs um, which uh, in the Roman world were often uh, um, uh, a place of uh, worship um, and uh, pilgrimage. Uh, after all there was no natural explanation for why hot water should come out of the ground um, therefore, the reason was obvious, it must be the work of the gods. Um, and so wherever there are hot springs, there were gods. Um, the, uh, the, the yellow line there shows the part of the site you can actually walk around at the Roman baths. Um, you can't actually get to, uh, today to the full extent of the, where the Roman remains were. Uh, in many cases, that's uh, simply because later buildings have led to their destruction and so on. But the Roman city is uh, about um, uh, uh, three to five metres uh, below uh, the normal ground level. Uh, so like Bishop's Hill, quite a lot of the site is um, uh, underground today, although of course in Roman times it, uh, there was nothing underground at all. Um, the <coughs> In thinking about uh, public engagement, um, uh, in 2007, we embarked on um, uh, a major kind of redevelopment plan, if you like, uh, for the Roman baths. Uh, it was originally 2007 to 12, but uh, in fact, we kept the concept going um, and uh, it became a 17. And um, in fact, it's still going on today. It's just that it's no longer called this. Uh, um, but uh, it was a couple of simple objectives, really. One was to maintain its position as a leading visitor attraction. And uh, uh, the second one, uh, sort of intimated by uh, the issues of being underground, is that uh, we wish to transform the accessibility of the site. Um, uh, because it is largely underground, there are actually 13 uh, sets of steps between the entrance and the exit, uh, which um, uh, given the emphasis on accessibility in um, uh, today, uh, wasn't great news, uh, certainly for anyone in a wheelchair and uh, um, actually not great news for quite a lot of uh, other visitors who, although they're capable of walking, were sometimes a bit challenged by 13 flights of steps. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, uh, it would uh, we spent about a million pounds a year and still do on uh, this uh, kind of development. Um, uh, the, uh, in thinking about it, um, uh, we've uh, seen reference in some of the earlier talks to uh, different ways in which uh, a site uh, might be used. Um, and so we felt we needed a few guiding principles and values that we should be upfront about at the start. Um, the, not every way you develop a site is ne necessarily, uh, you know, that great or uh, uh, sympathetic to it. And so uh, we wanted to put a few principles in place. And so these uh, were the ones that uh, we came up with uh, at the time, um, bearing in mind that uh, the uh, uh, in 
in making a significant investment in the site, uh, the people giving us the money, who are of course the local council, um, also wanted to see a return on it. And uh, uh, it's a site that's been there for nearly 2000 years. So we felt that sustainability was also a very strong guiding principle in um, underpinning everything we should do. And uh, so we produced this model of sustainability um, in which uh, uh, conservation of the monument of the core resource was seen as a key issue. Um, the, uh, uh, the interface with customers who uh, use it and support it and who are the modern beneficiaries of the site and also the commercial development without which um, there, uh, you know, if a site doesn't have um, a reliable uh, uh, source of uh, financial support from somewhere, um, then its prospects aren't actually going to be very good. And uh, the principle we try to establish with um, all our uh, people we communicated with and our supporters was that we had to invest roughly equally in each of these three strands. Um, that uh, on the grounds that if you only invested in commercial activity and neglected conservation and customers, uh, then that's probably not a great way to uh, go into the future. And the same would be the case with conservation. If you put all your con resources into conservation, um, but ignored the interests of uh, uh, having a found sound financial base and uh, care for your customers, then you're probably just as badly uh, off in the long term. You do have to have a, a balanced approach. Uh, but uh, public engagement is principally about the customers, and so that's what I'll be referring to as we go through today. Um, so these are some of the uh, things that uh, we uh, uh, introduced. And as you can see, those uh, uh, conservation access is for the benefit of the public, uh, as is uh, interpretation. Um, the uh, revealing more of the monument is uh, uh, conservation related. Uh, and to then at the bottom, refurbishing the shops, you know, this is actually quite important. We also have a significant catering operation on site. Um, <clears throat> the um, introducing these kind of changes uh, can be quite tricky. Um, uh, when I started work at the Roman Bars 30 years ago, um, if you had a wheelchair, you could uh, come in through the entrance door, uh, walk around a terrace, well, uh, drive around a terrace uh, and look down on the Great Bars and then you could go out again and you couldn't see any of the rest of the site. Um, that's because there were no serviceable lifts or ramps or anything like that. Um, We've now progressed uh, through this development plan to a position where we have four lifts uh, within the building um, for public use. Um, and each one has to be very carefully designed and negotiated because the site is a scheduled ancient monument, which is the um, highest grade of um, heritage protection you can have uh, in Britain. It tops most, uh, most other planning constraints. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the object in putting this system of lifts in was um, um, to uh, avoid any damage at all to any of the historic fabric. Um, and uh, actually we did succeed in doing this, um, uh, perhaps remarkably, but uh, it did prove possible. But in doing it, we had to completely alter the route that the public took through the building. Um, if you look at the uh, top right image there, it shows a staircase next to a lift. And uh, the, uh, because that was a good place for the lift, we put the staircase there because hitherto the stairs had been in a completely different place. So putting a lift in doesn't always just mean putting a lift in. It can mean um, much bigger things than that. Um, the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, also, um, when you get down to the Great Bath, uh, this brought us to another issue with accessibility, uh, which is intellectual accessibility. And uh, uh, what is happening here is the visitor in the wheelchair is um, uh, engaging in conversation with uh, a couple of Romans. Um, 
And uh, those Romans are known to us uh, through inscriptions uh, that uh, survive. And uh, we uh, know their names, they're Salinus and Brucitus. And uh, their brief is to uh, uh, speak in period. Uh, their costume is uh, also very carefully um, uh, controlled in terms of how it's made and so on. And uh, they're uh, here with uh, a finial they've just made, uh, which is actually based on an original finial uh, from the Roman baths, because they're doing some repair work because one's fallen off. Um, and uh, uh, so this is a way in which people can engage uh, with the people of the past. Um, <clears throat> Now, if you translate that to Bishop's Hill, um, the gentleman on the left uh, could easily be the city engineer and an architect. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's a different, uh, it's, it's a transferable concept, really. But the point is that uh, uh, costume interpretation, if done well, uh, can be a great way to uh, get information. You don't have to put a graphic panel up to communicate all your information. Um, we also uh, were, were very sensitive to disability and so we had tactile uh, displays uh, throughout for uh, people uh, with uh, uh, problems with sight and uh, uh, we've also more recently um, uh, put in spe place special arrangements for people with autism. Um, the, uh, a lot of people suffer from autism in one form or another and uh, so the arrangements uh, we put in include special evenings when the place is less busy, uh, where they have exclusive use of the site. Um, and uh, the gentleman on the left was from the Autism Society there who uh, presented us with their first ever award. Um, a British Sign Language tour was also introduced uh, for people who can't hear very well. Um, and uh, the person on it is uh, someone who's been doing sign language on the BBC for probably about 20 years. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> another strand was uh, conservation. And uh, uh, you can see here the uh, cleaning of statues around uh, the Great Bath. Um, thinking of Bishop's Hill, uh, these statues are actually vintage uh, 1897. Um, and uh, would have been seen by uh, people coming uh, to the windows on the left and looking out at the Great Bar. And of course, what they would have been looking at was very certain individual Roman characters um, that uh, were known to them, uh, probably from their Latin, Latin textbooks, because at the end of the 19th century, most people who went to a good school um, uh, almost certainly were taught Latin. And so these were all characters that they would have known from their textbooks at school. Um, so uh, it's interesting that uh, that because today very few people learn Latin at school and uh, some of the people they would see there would therefore not be known to them but uh, there are a selection of famous Roman emperors and uh, uh, governors of Britain um, particularly those that tended to have connections with the southwest of England where that is cited. Um, the uh, <clears throat> um, uh, Interpretation was extensively reworked and we tried to um, convert the museum really from somewhere that was quite art historically led uh, to one where the emphasis was on people and uh, more accessible forms of interpretation. So that included using techniques such as uh, projection, uh, use of traditional models, which uh, people really do enjoy um, costumed interpretation I've mentioned, uh, use of interactive surround the site um, and so on. And uh, here are uh, just some close-ups of some of those. Um, another point was um, uh, in presenting the monument, um, we took out a lot of things that had been gradually incrementally accrued over the years. And one thing you see when you look at that is that there are no graphic panels. Um, I have a bit of a thing about 
graphic panels. I, I think they are quite a clumsy way of interpreting things uh, sometimes, and they can get very long. Uh, and if you were to pepper that with graphic panels giving information, um, you would really lose uh, 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 quite a lot of the look and feel of the ancient monument. And instead, we rely for our basic interpretation on audio tours. Um, the, uh, there you are, you see, look across the bath, there's not a graphic panel in sight. Um, same here, actually, pretty well. Um, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> the, in doing the displays, we did try to be reasonably inter uh, um, innovative. Um, and uh, during the course of this program, a large group of coins uh, was found um, nearby, very close to the Roman baths, and it was included in the museum displays. And uh, so from a public engagement point of view, um, we did what you might expect, which is to produce an academic publication on the hall. We also produced a popular publication. But beyond that, we did uh, 17 road shows in local villages where we took coins out uh, into the local community. Um, we did uh, 60 talks and lectures to local societies so within the space of 12 months about this uh, hoard. We produced a film about it. We organized conservation days. Uh, we even produced uh, a game that you could play on the internet. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, we also did some work with specialist community groups, um, uh, people who had difficulty with maths um, uh, or people who in terms of their personal financial management had got into trouble. And this is because coins are a way uh, of actually communicating with quite a broad audience. Everybody has a relationship with money. And rather like everyone has a relationship with water. And uh, because everyone has a relationship with money, they can usually connect to it in some way. And so it is a way of getting in to meet and to engage with people who, uh, if you say, are you interested in archeology? span might well say, I'm not, not at all, but they are interested in money and they like to see it, especially when it's shiny. <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, in a display of coins, which are traditionally a very difficult object to display, uh, we uh, enhance that with, uh, um, uh, some text, but also audio, film, and tactile replicas as well that uh, uh, improve that. And uh, uh, taking the theme of people and connecting with the past through people, um, the what you have here on the left is uh, a tombstone, uh, rather um, uh, difficult to understand because it's written in Latin and if you do understand Latin then you still can't read it because it's abbreviated Latin uh, so a lot of the letters are omitting um, and uh, it's actually telling you about an armourer from the 20th legion um, and so the projected image there actually shows you an armourer uh, going about his daily tasks of looking after the kit um, uh, and uh, so that is a kind of it way of taking a difficult to use object and uh, make it more accessible for people. And uh, audio tours I mentioned, particularly the fact that uh, uh, they can, uh, they're now in 12 languages. Um, the, uh, uh, interestingly, after uh, English, the uh, most used uh, language um, uh, is Mandarin and uh, uh, about 10% uh, of our visitors uh, choose uh, a Mandarin audio tour. Um, but uh, in providing an audio tour, you can uh, do the straight kind of curatorial type of tour, which is probably the sort of thing I would, uh, that I've done. Uh, but uh, you can also get other people who have a different perspective on the world uh, to come along. Um, and, uh, you know, they're not necessarily serious historians or archaeologists. Um, and so we invited some other people uh, to develop tours for us. Uh, and with us. And so Bill Bryson, well-known author, came along and gave his uh, particular view of the site. 
Michael Rosen, who was at the time the Children's Poet Laureate, um, uh, the, uh, uh, did the children's tour for us. Um, I mentioned projection. Um, what projection is a, a good technique for engaging with people um, uh, because it's also very sympathetic to conservation. Um, with this pediment, um, uh, we believe it was probably coloured originally, although we don't know exactly what the colour scheme would have been. Uh, but in this uh, projection, we've uh, suggested what it might have looked like. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, we've used projection quite a lot around uh, the site. It's something that comes and goes. So if you find technology irritating, then you can also appreciate um, the ancient stonework without that intervention. And uh, in a space like this, which um, uh, is um, uh, an underground space, of course, where you're going over part of the monument. Um, we've introduced uh, um, uh, CGI animations, which uh, show the uh, space that you are in um, as it would have appeared in Roman times. So uh, when you stand and look at uh, the, uh, uh, the screen, um, that is the view that you would have seen in Roman times from where you're standing. And uh, there was another one going the other way that uh, shows the view in the other direction. Uh, one of the great things about CGI is that uh, uh, you can put things like cracks into buildings now, which gives them an amazing degree of authenticity. <laughs> uh, but uh, the people you see there are people who you will have seen at those character stations uh, throughout the museum. Uh, they are a consistent interpretive thread. And they're all different people known from inscriptions uh, who had specific roles on the site. Um, uh, most recently, uh, we've um, uh, done some work in the East Baths, um, developing projections as a concept. And uh, 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 we've projected directly onto the walls of the monument in the past. Uh, this is uh, another example of um, a CGI. Uh, but uh, we've also done this, um, which seems to have worked particularly well. And uh, this is um, not to project onto walls at all, but to create projections that exist in 3D, uh, in space. Um, so it's a sort of holographic effect. Um, and uh, so it's allowed us to take people off the walls and actually put them into the space, doing the kind of things you would have done in Roman times. Now, this in a different uh, existence, this uh, could be a, a view of, uh, for instance, uh, people uh, carrying out maintenance work in the Bishop's Hill Reservoir, <laughs> um, uh, you know, wearing the kind of clothes they would have worn uh, 80 years ago. Um, but you see how it's done by using green screens in a studio. Um, and uh, then uh, it's, it's actually projected onto an incredibly fine mesh that the viewer's not really aware of. Um, and uh, it's very successful in this space. And of course, the great, thing, another, the great thing about it, again, from a conservation point of view, is it poses no risk to the monument. Um, uh, some of the collections have been uh, designated by uh, UNESCO as part of its memory of the world. And uh, these include the small lead curses that uh, were thrown into the hot spring at Bath. Um, some of the most uh, uh, obscure objects in many ways that you could imagine, uh, but uh, they um, I do tell you things, uh, for instance, that Dotimedes, who had lost two gloves or had them stolen, asked that the person who has stolen them should lose both his mind and his eyes. And, uh, uh, the, uh, and asked for the goddess's help in uh, doing that. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, so this is, uh, these displays are linked to um, uh, uh, film that shows a, a distraught person coming from the baths uh, to a scribe for get his help writing one of these. So it's trying to make it a human story. 
Um, we also use uh, interactive animations. And this is actually quite important, emotional intensity. Um, the, uh, the Roman bars, uh, helped by good lighting, of course, um, uh, can um, uh, be a re really quite wonderful um, atmospheric place to be. And one could imagine that, uh, you know, having seen some of those scenes of uh, uh, the, um, the great system at Istanbul, the Basilica system, um, there's a certain synergy here. And uh, emotional intensity can manifest itself in other ways. Uh, we've become a very popular place for people to get married. Um, we only allow them to do it between 8 and 8.30 in the morning and uh, after we close in the evenings. Um, but again, it's another use and a way in which people can engage. Um, the other thing we do, we're run by a local authority, so it's very worried about its local residents. Um, we give our local residents free admission, even though uh, the rest of the world has to pay. And that's always very popular. Um, and of course, you can engage with a site in all kinds of ways. Um, uh, the, uh, this is a group of local guides who had a sleepover here. <laughs> um, the, uh, I remember I mentioned that uh, we did all those things with the Roman coin hoard uh, when we did 17 sleepovers. That was really a trial run. And uh, we now offer this as uh, about once a month we can have a sleepover. Uh, with a, usually a local group of some kind on site. And, uh, you know, the phrase a night to remember is uh, certainly something we hope we're giving to those local people. And of course, in doing this, we think we're also helping uh, to create the audience for the future. Uh, when these uh, kids grow up, uh, hopefully they'll come back um, with their own children and perhaps with their friends and families um, and uh, to, uh, to visit us. The, uh, there are some things we don't do. Um, we don't do VR. Um, the, uh, there are obviously uh, some, some risks involved with that. If you're walking around with a box on your head uh, next to a large pool of water, um, you know, there's one consequence that we could all predict. So we decided not to go down that route. Um, <laughs> uh, augmented reality is uh, a little different and uh, using things like AR specs, that's more tempting, um, but we don't do it uh, for logistical reasons, uh, really, which is that we're already giving people an audio tour. If you give them specs as well, um, you're starting to clutter them up with mobile technology, because they've also got their own phone to manage. Um, and so, although it's very tempting, we haven't done it yet. Um, and it also takes time to hand out and collect and all this kind of thing, which in terms of managing our site is quite challenging. So what's next? Um, coming up, um, the, uh, this is the view from our school's room. Um, uh, unfortunately, we've only got one. Um, the result is that uh, children spill over into um, 19th century very fine rooms, uh, but um, uh, if you've come to study the Romans, being in a room with a chandelier hanging from the ceiling can be a bit misleading. Um, so we feel we needed uh, better facilities. Um, and so we developed this thing called the Archway Project uh, after uh, an arch adjacent to the building um, uh, to develop a new learning center. And uh, you can see that uh, here it says completion end 2020. Well, it's actually going to be completion May 2021 now, but uh, that's uh, partly due to COVID and so on. But if you look at this, um, uh, you can see the, uh, the Roman bars on the left-hand side of the picture, and there's a road between the two. And then there's uh, some industrial buildings to the south that we've taken over as uh, a new learning center. They were originally old spa buildings, hence the rather dramatic chimney. And they're connected underground to the Roman bars underneath the road. Um, and uh, so uh, it's uh, taken uh, more than two years to uh, realize this project. 
uh, but uh, it should make a major difference to us and improve our engagement uh, with the public. But um, the, uh, and you can see here its footprint, uh, the uh, yellow buildings and also the uh, dotted buildings is the area under the space that we will use, uh, where teaching will take place in and amongst um, the Roman ruins on the site. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, but, um, uh, and that uh, complex will also include a new World Heritage Centre for the city. I say a new one, it has never had one. Uh, it will be its first World Heritage Centre for the city uh, because Bath does have World Heritage status and the Roman remains are deemed to be one of the um, outstanding universal values of the site. Um, the, uh, on the learning front, of course, in the last 12 months, we've um, uh, all had COVID pressures. And uh, so we very much developed our uh, internet learning program. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, we developed sessions that can be uh, dropped into classrooms um, uh, through video screens. Um, to communicate with schools. Uh, but in this latest lockdown, we're also offering um, uh, sessions that can be delivered basically through Zoom um, uh, to individual school children uh, in uh, their private homes. Um, this image actually shows my grandson last year. Uh, he lives in Shanghai and uh, uh, he was locked down uh, last February. And here he is having a home teaching session um, uh, on, on his kitchen table. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, Ro the Roman Bars is an interesting site. It's really quite a special one, uh, which uh, prompted one of its uh, patrons, Sir Barry Cunliffe, who excavated here to make these comments a few years ago. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it's a site much loved by visitors. Uh, we get tremendously positive feedback from people who've come. Um, but um, the, that feedback is actually very important to us because it is a driver for development. And when that public, uh, when that uh, development project was uh, run, um, the, we're, we're in a position where we get feedback directly from visitors, just got comments they make, and we collect all these and we analyze them. And we get about 5,000 a month. And so what, it soon becomes clear if you've got a problem because people do mention it. And uh, so in the past, people have mentioned uh, that uh, it was quite a long way to go around. It would have been good to have had some more seats. Uh, so uh, what we did, we introduced some more seats around the museum. Uh, not a big deal, uh, but um, actually we found that those comments then just disappeared. And we had one part of the museum, which we'd always known was a bit stuffy and hot. Um, not least because it had a ventilation system that took hot air from outside in summer and blew it on people who were already hot. Um, <laughs> so they got even hotter. Um, and uh, in winter, it took cold air from outside and blew it on people who were inside mm -hmm. who were cold and they got even colder. So uh, we used that as um, evidence to uh, argue for funding to improve our uh, uh, environmental conditioning system, uh, which when we introduced it, uh, gave an equable temperature for visitors, but also a more suitable environment uh, to protect the ancient monument and uh, minimise the, uh, the risk of salt damage from uh, a rising damp, um, which affected the Roman monument. Uh, Roman engineers uh, could be quite amazing, but um, as uh, Jim Crow's talk uh, demonstrated, but uh, they weren't always good at putting damp proof courses in buildings. And uh, one of the consequences of this is you do get a lot of salt damage on Roman sites. Um, so um, uh, there we are. Um, uh, the, uh, so that kind of feedback is, and engagement is important. We also use focus groups um, for things like um, uh, all kinds of small things to do with the site. We'll discuss that with them. 
Um, we contact regularly with our residents association nearby because the people around you immediately are very important. Um, the, uh, equally with the local traders association because there are many shops near us and we have regular communication channels with these people. So we let them know what we want for the future. We invite them in, we offer them a free drink um, uh, to come in and uh, uh, just, just hear about our plans for the future. Um, so, uh, and then of course we do the sort of things you'd expect us to do. We do things like, well, occasional research seminars related to aspects of the archeology span of the site for an academic audience. Um, and uh, so we try and do it on really quite a, a broad spectrum of uh, public engagement. And of course we, we are run by a local authority which is politically controlled. Um, this means that uh, every four years we may experience a change in the political party that uh, uh, is running the show. And so uh, it, one thing that is important to us when we're trying to think and plan for the long term, which is a longer term than a normal political term, because you're only, you're only elected for three or four years, um, so uh, therefore your horizon is limited to three or four years. Because we're trying to plan for a longer term, it's important to us to engage with politicians of all parties. And whenever we try and do anything to um, always move forward with um, uh, the consent and agreement of all of the parties so that we can do it um, with uh, a lot of public support behind us. So uh, I think uh, with that, I've uh, come to an end. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. A fantastic presentation and it's very, very informative and many, many good um, ideas for us, uh, especially for the future usage of the Paddington, uh, the future usage of the Bishop Hill Underground Reservoir. So uh, for our uh, next speaker is Professor Tim Greer. Uh, his presentation topic is Paddington Reservoir Gardens Case Study, the Adaptive Reuse and Redevelopment of Sydney's Paddington Reservoir Garden. Professor Tim Greer is a, a, a joint professor, School of Architect, Architecture and Design, Sydney University, and he's also the director of Chongqing Solaikan Real Architects, responsible for the Paddington Reservoir Gardens. Kim's interest is in the continuum of architecture and the overlapping of contemporary and historic buildings to frame and establish the public domain. So Professor Tim Greer, please. Ah, thank you. Now, I just got to find uh, my PowerPoint. <laughs> Seems to have now. Now, can everybody see that uh, front page? Uh, is, is there an image up there, Sharon? Yes, we can see it. Oh, oh great. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. hi everybody. And I'd, I'd like to just start by saying what a great initiative this is of Sharon's using new communication uh, technology to hopefully help um, some old infrastructure technology find a new, uh, I guess, meaningful uh, future. Uh, the project I'd like to talk about or we're going to talk about uh, this morning, this evening, uh, is the Paddington Reservoir Gardens for um, the, the City of Sydney uh, Council. Um, this project was led by Tonkin Talaka Greer Architects um, and the design development was done in association with Anton James from JMD Landscape Architecture and TZG Heritage was led by uh, Julie McKenzie. Um, and as practicing architects, I'd just like to put a little bit of definition around our architectural philosophy, I guess. Um, and Sharon just touched on it before, but um, I'm absolutely fascinated in this notion of the continuum of architecture and the overlapping of contemporary and historic buildings. Um, not, not, a, not, not as a means to its, its own end, but in a way of kind of um, framing and establishing uh, the public domains and our kind of uh, ever challenged uh, urban environments. Um, and I guess at a cultural level, we can think about this as a cultural continuum 
um, based on the notion that historic and contemporary cultures can be seen as interconnected. There's a kind of a continuum upon which the contemporary culture rests. And I think it's really interesting that the Roman Bars preceded that comment because it's so, so kind of clear there. Um, and, and we see that, you know, contemporary culture is merely the brightest light uh, of the moment. And this, this notion of a compilation of history, history is around us, therefore is in our present world. Um, now, I'm just hoping this is going to go forward. Uh, ah, here we go. Um, at a physical level, I, I'm really fascinated by the notion of the greater system. And I don't see buildings as objects and I'm right, they can't escape being part of an urban setting, a landscape. A, a social network, or in fact, a moment in time. And again, I think there's been countless examples of, 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 that, of that tonight. Um, and I'd like to view the city, a city as an evolving or organism, sort of ever, ever changing, thriving, dying, and receding, and most importantly for us, regenerating. And as we look at this kind of deliberately grainy aerial image of Sydney with its kind of stunning landscape made of uh, sandstone, uh, you know, a, a, a sandstone or stone and, and sand um, that, that has been occupied and managed and traversed by Australia's first peoples, uh, first peoples for tens of thousands of years. It's been portioned by politics and pragmatism. It's been scarred by 20th century infrastructure, and yet it's still managing to kind of, kind of flourish. And, and I have to say, I just find it uh, in, you know, in, in intriguing and a never ending source for, for architecture, the inevitable discord of the city with its energetic disrhythms formed by ad hoc collections. And I, I, I like to think of um, buildings as miniature cities. And we can see here the red dot denotes the location of the Paddington Reservoir. Um, and it's on a ridge. And this ridge in Sydney has, has, always, has historically been very important because, as I mentioned before, the first people, the, uh, the Gadigal, the Eora nation, uh, traversed uh, this ridge into the north as the sandstone of Sydney Harbour, uh, Port Jackson, and to the south is sand, the Botany Sands coming up from Botany Bay, which is effectively just the sands were blown up um, uh, from the south. Uh, we can see here, we start the story in the 1950s, where the reservoir, um, which was originally built in the 1860s and 1870s as two parts, um, but they were ultimately unsuccessful and abandoned in the 1890s. Um, it, it, what, what was one of many in a long line of failed attempts to find a secure water supply for, for Sydney. And when this photo was taken, um, the, the, the building pump house that uh, Nikki referred to earlier on was actually located here. Um, and at this time, the water board, who were the owner of the asset, had put a ramp here and they used it for storing uh, water board trucks and vehicles. And then located to the street onto Oxford Street is a service station or what we in this part of the world call a servo. Um, and of course, what, what had happened was the water board and their wisdom found that the reservoir leaked a little bit. Um, and so they had put a new steel structure through the inside with uh, steel posts and beams uh, and tin roofs. And of course, the steel corroded, expanded. The vaults were natural vaults and they, they kind of collapsed. And this is what we kind of inherited. This is actually scratching my head this afternoon to try and think when this is. I think it's about 2005, 2006. Um, and you can kind of see it's a very interesting comparison, the absolute fragile state that Paddington was in, um, in, in, in kind of comparison to Bishop Hill. Bishop Hill is in pristine con condition by comparison. Um, yes, a, a little piece of it's been knocked down, but it's, it's, it's nothing in comparison to this because it was kind of it was being it was being torn down from from the inside by inappropriate use of technology uh, contemporary technology in the 50s that you can see in the bottom right hand image and I, I love looking at these old photos because 
you can sort of see the chaos here. And when we finish a building, everything is kind of clear and sensible and understandable. But when we start, there's just this kind of fog of pure chaos um, that we have to uh, um, uh, pick our way through. And I think um, the archaeologists, the conservators, the people who write histories are, are so important to practicing architects to allow us to find um, the, the, the essence of, 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 of these buildings. But of course, what we had inherited was this extremely elegant piece of infrastructure engineering, which uh, dates back, well, possibly to Byzantium, who, who knows? Um, but we can kind of see that it's a highly refined um, model. It's, it's, been, it's been built over and over through the, through the centuries. Interestingly, this one, some of the components, the wrought and um, cast steelwork, uh, the water resistant lime, which was very technical for its time, were all sent out from the center of, of Australia's colonial world. England, of course, everything was sort of tethered back to the, to the mother, mother nature and uh, mother nation at this time. But interesting enough, the columns that were um, suspended in the water or, or sitting in the water, more to the point, were of a local timber called ironbark, which is an exceedingly tough uh, eucalypt that they worked out that as the water went up and down, it wasn't going to corrode the steel or in fact, um, rot the sandstone. Our, our sandstone is an exceedingly soft material. So if it has continual changing uh, weather conditions or, or states from uh, being above water or below water, it, it weathers uh, very uh, dramatically. Um, so I guess for me, the architectural approach for the Paddington Reservoir Gardens revolves around the notion that the architectural concept for the new use lurks within the artifact and everything in this building follows from this idea this was like our sketch uh, you know it evoked the kernel of of the design idea um, we we had inherited a ruin in a very young city uh, so we proposed a set of urban rooms nettle, nestled within these infrastructure remnants um, unfortunately, this was contrary to the brief uh, uh, that proposed just capping, capping over the park and building a new suburban park, very much like that, that 50s park. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, because this building only exists through political uh, will. Um, the, the kind of next thing that, that that conceptual idea led us to was the I guess the fragmentary and spatial richness of, of the ruin, ruin became the spatial and ordering system of the new, uh, the new gardens. Um, our materials, uh, so, so some of these ideas were philosophical, some were kind of master planning, and then some were very, very practical, such as that the, the new materials we used, we used them in a cellular form. The original building was made up of, of bricks, there's this very, you know, this hand component, cast and wrought pieces of steel and lengths of timber. So anything new we put in here was put in as a piece. So you can see the concrete pavers on the ground. They were our larger scale um, unit or, or cellular block. You can see the sunscreen up here, which is conceptually the mortar taken out of the brickwork and the brick is left as a void. Um, and the steel uh, uh, and the steel was obviously fabricated in components. We then chose only to use three materials because the original building only had three materials, timber, brick, and wrought and cast iron. And then we used uh, concrete, steel, and aluminium. And these were all devices so as not to overwhelm this really quite modest ruin that we've inherited. I mean, again, you compare it to um, Bishop's Hill, it's, it's petite in, 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 in comparison. And then the landscape architect, Anton James, had this really lovely idea of only using the plant species that were popular in Sydney in the 1860s and 70s. So this narrative became a way of sort of driving the design forward. And in this photo, which is the Eastern Chamber, which was predominantly intact, 
the lighting engineer came up with this idea that if you put red and blue light together, it forms this very awkward oscillation. So you get this sense of rippling water and you can go in here and it, it has a kind of evo evocation of water. Um, for those of us who are prone to epilepsy, uh, we, we have a, just a, a standard white light here for 99% for of the time. Um, you can see that um, the, the, the timber columns are, are new and this is referenced by the base. It's a little hard to see, but they have this little steel foot, which is a cruciform, and that has 2009 foot on that piece of steel. So we're just, uh, you know, we're just kind of building this story of the next stage uh, of, of, of the reservoir. Um, the plan um, was, was very much organized around those repeating arches that ran uh, a long ways east-west or from left to right of, of the image that, that you can see here. And the, so everything was around this deliberate fragmentary um, nature of the project, which we start to pick up in, in these sections. And if we look at the bottom one that our new sunscreens are doing a couple, uh, doing a, a couple of things. They are, they are of course, um, uh, keeping the sun out of the base of the reservoir, but they're also telling us that there is something below street and you can see here, this is Oxford Street. It's elevated above the body of the reservoir. And what becomes really fascinating working with these sorts of structures is that we can start to engage with a lot of urban ideas that are not permissible when you start from scratch. For example, every good uh, sensible planner will tell you that the public domain must not exist below street level because um, you, can't see, you can't see into it. It's, it's not surveyed. Um, so we were able to kind of work with this, but the idea is that when you hear you look up, you see the awning and that's the cue that there is something down below. Um, when, if you cast your minds back to that chaotic image of, of collapse, um, there was something that we could never work out. It took us a very long time to work out, but the two reservoirs, you can kind of see their, their bottoms here, were actually built with, a, with essentially a pitched roof over the top. And for a long time, our survey information, nothing was kind of adding up. We couldn't work out why these levels were seemingly wrong. And it was because it wasn't a flat path park at all. It had this very pronounced uh, ridge and that became something that we worked with because all of our new work was deliberately uh, dead level so that it accentuated um, the, these, these kind of very strange angles. And the other thing that was going on while we were designing and, and documenting this building, the arches just kept collapsing. And of course, any, any kind of public building delivered in, in Sydney or in New South Wales is delivered through very prescriptive lump sum building contracts. So we didn't have that kind of luxury that an architect like Carlos Scarpa may have worked with of going and looking and drawing and then building. We, we had to predict everything and we knew we couldn't predict everything. So we came up with a series of what we called architectural conditions where you kind of see at the top where there's a bit of brick vault and there's a new concrete vault behind it there. There's a totally new concrete vault. And then there's a brick vault, which merely has a concrete lid on top of it. And with our building contract, we, we had to um, engineer a building contract that said, if this happens, you apply this system and the rate for that system is that. So it was predetermined at the commencement of the project. And that was, whilst that sounds a very pragmatic thing to say, it was um, exceedingly important in the enabling of the, of the project. Uh, you've got to put this into context. Uh, whilst we've had um, lots of uh, stupendous uh, archaeological restorations, or, or not necessarily restorations, exposing um, uh, 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 footings and bases of, of, of buildings in Sydney. This was a kind of whole park. This was to be a total public public domain. Um, I'd just like to go back to the section for a moment. And one of the very important things was that we lifted up the ground plane off the bottom for several reasons. One is that this bottom was highly significant in terms of the very advanced uh, lime technology for waterproofing at the time, but it also allowed us to put all of the infrastructure underneath. So again, we weren't obscuring 
um, our, our inheritance, if, if, if you like. And then it allows us to keep everything off the edge so we could light the whole, um, the whole space from seamlessly and uh, hidden from below. Um, so we kind of start to look here and we can, we can see a sort of an image at this point, we're sitting down um, in, in the, uh, what is the, the Western, Western Reservoir, um, we get a sense of this idea of remnant uh, uh, spaces. Um, and we've even located sort of a remnant pond. You know, I mean, of course, there's lots of talk about would we fill it through a water, but this piece of water is very much just about evoking um, uh, the sense of the, the, the waterness. And what was really interesting was that we positioned this pond so that we got reflections of the water on the feet. Obviously, we can't see it here because it's at night time, but you can see the lights for the brick the brick um, vaults are below the water, so you actually don't see the, where they're coming from. And at the top of our street, where our offices, which I mentioned earlier, Reservoir Street, there was a reservoir, and we were lucky enough to get in there. And it wasn't quite like the James Bond film, but it was spectacular because there were guys in there in wetsuits uh, swimming in the reservoir, checking out some of the infrastructure, and as they came to the surface, we could see their, their reflection. And you just saw, uh, you saw this body and then you saw the arches reflected in the water. It's one of the most discompobulating things I've, I've witnessed. And, and this water was just a sort of a, a, an idea of, 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 of hinting, hinting at that. Um, we played a lot with the scale of this reservoir. And what's really fascinating is that um, you know, the thing about, uh, I guess, 19th century infrastructure is that, you know, I suspect um, to do with the materials it was made of and the pride of the time, um, these, these buildings were beautifully built. They were they're almost like handcrafted uh, buildings, which we don't seem to be able to do now, but it had this very small scale. And we wanted to reflect that and, and, and our work, so to the, the gray element is the, the lift shaft, concealing the, the lift, and the horizontal lines, obviously just an evocation of, of water. And then you see the, the sunscreen and we get a sense here that the sunscreen, the patterning of the sunscreen is the mortar joints that have just been, um, I guess, sort of magically pulled out of, of the, brick, the brick arches. I mean, again, if we start to look across the whole reservoir, it, it, it very quickly it became apparent that um, the structure that we inherited had a whole lot of spatial, I guess, um, I guess poss possibilities, um, and that um, the the idea that um, the space doesn't need to be complete or perfect, it can be fragmentary. And as we, um, uh, and so we, we deliberately didn't complete spaces. We put the circulation in, in line with, with the vaults and we were very um, deliberate not to um, kind of, um, not, not, to, not to complete things, not to finish the picture, I, I guess, and a little bit. And then, of course, with any, any piece of um, uh, public space, we have to do all these things to protect us humans because we do crazy things. So we need, we need gates, we need signage, we need balustrades. And, and, and I can't say how refreshing it was, Stephen, that you were talking about removing all of the interpretation signage out of those spaces because, again, it's about you inherit something special, how do you keep it special? And we have this propensity to fill it up with stuff. And so the idea here is that these, these three essential things, balustrades, gates, and signage, were actually part of one language. And this language, as you can see in the kind of gate, is working with this incomplete um, remnant party, I guess, for, for lack of lack of better, better words. So, you know, the sign tells you about the Eastern Chamber, it's part of the security system, but the letters are sort of in bits and pieces like, uh, like, like the reservoir. So this is looking, um, uh, this is looking one way and then this is looking out to, towards the West. We're now inside the chamber 
uh, look, looking out. Um, and then uh, I guess, um, let me go, go to here, um, you know, just picking up on this theme of, of the de deliberately um, not architecturally completing the, the, the project to make sure that everything was open-ended. And, and I'd, I'd really like to think that, um, that, that there is many Paddington Reservoir Gardens as there are visitors, that somebody can find an incomplete vista, a view, you know, whether it's a nighttime or a daytime, that uh, because our minds are, it's a bit a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle, our minds are completing, are completing the picture. And I think that's why historic ruins are just so exciting, they're so evocative, because your mind is desperately trying to complete the complete the picture. Well, maybe that's just mine, but that that's you know, the, and I think everybody does. And, and you hear these discussions of, oh no, that would have been there, or that would have been there, and and it's just kind of keeps uh, it keeps uh, these buildings totally totally alive in a way. Um, and I just just as we look at um, sort of closing out now a little bit, but um, this notion of political will. Um, we we were asked our, our brief was to cap the park and make a make a good piece of public open space, maybe with some access down to the bottom so people could get in and see what was once there. And uh, we just thought there was this incredible idea to build some gardens within a ruin, and uh, the the we we worked with fantastic. Um, staff at the, at, the, at the city of Sydney, Chris Thomas in, in particular. And whilst they could see, see the vision um, and, and the, what, what was a very sound kind of argument for this project, it just, it just sort of failed at so many points in terms of protocols around public space, managing public assets, et cetera. But they, they, they said, the council said, look, we'll give you an audience with the mayor, you get five minutes you get one shot. And if um, the Lord Mayor Clovermore liked it, then, then we'll consider proceeding. So we, we made our presentation and she got it instantly. It was really a kind, of, kind of amazing. She referred to some other gardens. Um, the issue around uh, safety was solved in the meeting with uh, at the end of Oxford Street is the Centennial Parklands, uh, which are locked at, um, dusk and unlocked at dawn and an agreement was made that that person would come and lock the the reservoir at uh, at dusk and reopen it in dawn so it was it was not only a, a meeting of political vision and and will but it also solved a, a fundamental pragmatic uh, issue and that political will uh, carried this project and then you kind of see that being repaid in terms of the benefits for this area. Uh, the reservoir was built in what's called sort of the Paddington Town Centre. It was originally a colonial town centre. It had a post office, a town hall, a couple of churches, a pub, all those essential things. Um, and <clears throat> th this is uh, um, completely centred, uh, that area. It was, a, it was on a high road, so there was no kind of pause on, on the high road. This gave the high road a kind of a pause and th th this project's then become uh, a precedent for numerous other projects in, in Sydney that have now had a chance because of, of, of the opportunity. And I think that notion of political will and good governance is actually the, the, at the nub of, of whether these projects are successful or not, or more to the point, whether they are, um, see the light of, light of day. Um, and I just, I just like to sort of, um, I think by way of a conclusion, um, I'd like to think that our, that our design approach allows for a contemporary expression of, of, of a new use with technical innovation, modern commodity and current relevancy. Um, but they introduce an aesthetic uh, common territory for past and present uh, to meet. And for me, it's this tension between the past and the present um, that generates the architectural expression of kind of a third ethereal building that you can't quite put your finger on. 
And for me, that's the magic of, of, of architecture. And it never ceases sort of to, to amaze me how this, this approach is received by the broader community. And I think it has to do with the fact that, that it's to do with the retention of the site's uh, perceived consciousness and memory, because everybody kind of remembers the site they have, they associate uh, meanings to it. And that's all retained, even though a kind of a shiny new partner has, has arrived. And so then um, I guess I'd sort of argue that as architects, we can, I don't want to sound too, too over the top, but we can, we can actually magically sort of transcend time um, with more than one generation uh, being represented at once, which of course is, is why we as architects must um, advocate um, to represent our generation in its entirety. So, um, Thank you for asking me to uh, talk uh, this morning, this evening. Um, uh, it's been a totally fascinating listening to all of the wonderful speakers. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I totally agree. Um, you talk about it's so important, especially when we think about the sites. Um, we need to persist the consciousness and the memory uh, more than one generation. I think. It, uh, in the future, it's also important to us when we talk about the preservation of Bishop Hill uh, Reservoir. Okay, so uh, right now, I think uh, all our speakers can see the question. So uh, right now, we'll uh, go into our discussion and Q&A session. So I just stopped my sharing so that um, all the speakers can show in the gallery mode. So you um yeah for the speakers uh please turn on your chat box. So I will I will read uh the questions again, but uh for you it's good for you to uh read the question directly so I can read it for our uh, uh audience. So uh I just find the questions from uh Wendy Ng. Um so based on her uh try to read it. Uh, I think this question is asking yeah uh especially for Stephen. yeah but um it's uh, other speakers can also um answer especially for the uh third question so uh when you ask uh, thank you very much for the fascinating and fruitful talk so far i enjoyed it very much and i really love the idea of uh skip overs how could you come up with such a great idea yeah i also like it yeah, <laughs> I have some question here. First question is, is it common to find underground system in circular form? Second question, I could see one slide showing the flooring around the room and bath, which is empty bumpy. Uh, knowing that wheelchair could get access to that level. Is that a problem to them or not at all? Uh, the third question, uh, would you have any suggestions on the interpretation of Bishop Hill Surface Reservoir in Hong Kong? Thank you very much. Stephen? <laughs> yeah, I like uh, steep overs <laughs> in women's bath. Yeah, please turn on your mic, yeah. So do I speak or use the chat? Uh, yes, uh, it's in the Q&A Q &A, Q &A, uh, button, you can see the question. So first one is, is that common to find the underground system in a circular form? I think maybe maybe Jim, you also know that, right? Um, yeah, it's not it's not uncommon. Um, there is a very big one in in Istanbul, which was actually an earlier building because there's a tendency later on to recycle buildings. Um, so you have a very large building which was partly demolished and then it was turned into a system and that's absolutely circular. So they, you can get circular systems. So I, th um, it's, I think it's interesting the one at Bishop's Hill because I think conventionally they would be rectangular partly because, and, and I think Tim would probably know better because of the structural engineering aspect of it. You know, it's actually easier to get your, your vaulting system is rectilinear. Um, you know, you have a, a series of vaults and they're essentially at right angles to one another. So if you have something which is circular, you then have to fit it within the pre-existing, um, you know, you have a vaulting system, which is actually has to sit within a circular structure, which is slightly problematic, I would have thought, and is rather interesting about that. Um, there's, there's always the question, I suppose, that something circular has a, a sort of sense, has a, a sense of greater strength, but 
when you're dealing with something which is essentially under, which is sunk into the ground and doesn't have external walls, that's not such an issue. Yeah, Tim, do you have any comment, especially uh, in Sydney's case? Is that common to find underground um, system in secular form? Um, well, I think I think every city's d different, and, and where they're generally found in Sydney is, is in gridded streets. But uh, as as Jim was saying, it's 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 that the the system is embedded in the ground, so that the water's pushing out in, in into into the ground. Um, I, I was very, I have to say, I was very interested in the second part of that question, which was around the notion of interpretation. And I think where we've got to with interpretation is that this is an incredibly broad um, subject in, in its, its own right. It, it couldn't start with a design strategy. You could use an interpretive design strategy to design a new building, or you could, and, and then you can keep going. And it was just really spectacular to see the bath examples of, of actually animating people in, in, in spaces. And I, and I like to think of interpretation that there's, there's the, the kind of really um, esoteric or, or kind of pr profound interpretation at one end. And then there's the very literal and immediate interpretation at the other. And I think everything that sits within that arc is, is, is quite valid because it's all about the storytelling. And, and you know, there are those kind of two views of heritage is that heritage is about storytelling, telling, but you need you need the object, um, you need the artifact, you need the remnant as the anchor for the story. People still need to, you know, touch something or or sleep on it, as we found out. Interesting. And uh, our webinar uh, supporting staff, Sam Nye, uh, he asked all of you maybe circular reflecting the uh, topography being at the top of the hill at Bishop's Hill, yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, I think I can uh, talk a bit on that because um, as we are architect, uh, we these two weeks actually, uh, many of our architectural friends and also myself is um, researching and also uh, gathering more data on this reservoir. And this morning, I was uh, overlaying the site plans, uh, which I've shown in my slides. And I kind of start to uh, believe it's because of the shape of the hill, when you have a, um, the depth of the reservoir um, and uh, you, you, if you do it in a rectangular shape and also the shape of, of the hill, um, it's kind of, um, you cannot fit the rectangular shape into the top of the hill. So I think that's kind of the reason why they do it in a circular form that also respect the topography of the top side of the hill. And also as and circular, I think um, um, it could be kind of balancing the, the force of the of the outside earth and also the in, in, interior of the water. So it's uh, kind of another reason. But I think the topography is one of the main reasons. Mm, yeah, I agree. It's very interesting. Okay, um, Stephen, your turn. Um, the second question about the uh, flooring around the women bath, which is quite bumpy. <laughs> uh, yes, it, uh, it can be quite bumpy in places. Um, uh, the... <clears throat> And uh, there are two points there. Uh, one is that it can be bumpy for the person in the wheelchair. Uh, it can also be bumpy for the ancient monument that's experiencing uh, the impact of the wheelchair uh, on itself. <laughs> um, so you know, it can, could be a conservation issue. Uh, having said that, we have uh, over a million people a year uh, visiting the site and uh, they all walk across it. It is an ancient monument. Uh, this is the only part of the ancient monument, actually, where uh, people go directly onto it. In other places, uh, they're usually suspended over it in some way. Um, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, what you see in terms of behaviour with people in wheelchairs is that uh, quite often, if those people are quite elderly, um, they... Uh, they, they will only go so far. They won't actually go all the way around the Great Bath area. Um, the, uh, uh, what you'll also see is that uh, younger and fitter people who just happen to be in a wheelchair for you know, some reason like an accident or something, actually see it as a challenge. Um, 
and uh, uh, have a sort of mountain bike biking approach to it as they uh, negotiate it. Um, the, our feeling is that uh, not as uh, in terms of total numbers, number of people in wheelchairs is actually quite low. Um, that uh, it's um, a level of attrition that we can manage and cope with. Fortunately, the um, the paving around the Great Bath is actually a very resilient material. Um, it's managed to acquire a polish uh, over the years due to the passage of many feet. Um, and when you see the earliest uh, photographs from the discovery of the site, uh, you, you can uh, see the condition the paving was in then. Um, and although it's acquired a polish, it hasn't actually really eroded. Um, the uh, English Heritage once uh, did uh, a survey of the site. It was called a precise level survey. And uh, they came back every six months and 12 months and uh, then two years to actually just literally measure in a micro way the surface to see if they could detect a wear pattern. And the only change that occurred was one year when the entire site, uh, according to their results, actually rose two centimetres. Um, <laughs> Uh, for which we never had a, an adequate explanation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the next time they came, it had gone back down again. So we assumed it was all right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, so uh, I, I think at the moment it's manageable. The, uh, we have thought about uh, introducing a special kind of wheelchair that might look, um, uh, think of a like, like something like a Mars Rover. Um, that would, uh, uh, which is adapted to going over bumpy surfaces and has large wheels, perhaps with low pressure tires, which might be a way of getting over the bumps. But what you tend to find is that people coming in wheelchairs um, often have a, a wheelchair that is adapted in some way to themselves. And they're not always actually able to just quickly slip over into another device that you might supply. And if you do, because they're unfamiliar with it, they probably won't be very good at controlling it. So um, that sort of summarizes some of the issues around it. But uh, so I'd say that at present, it's something that we're monitoring and uh, uh, we do have to give people assistance sometimes because they, uh, they can get into the bumpiest parts, uh, but then, um, uh, then they get stuck, and uh, at which point one of our front of house staff will go and rescue them <laughs> and give them a push. And Stephen, uh, follow up uh, Wendy Yu's question about the idea of uh, sleep overs. Uh, I would like to reframe a little bit about the question because um, you talk about the sleep overs um, for the children, actually, they are the local, local people, right? Um, because uh, I also know that uh, the Roman bath is also a UNESCO site. So how can you balance different shareholders' um, uh, privileges? For example, like UNESCO, uh, you have to fulfill the uh, universal outstanding values. But at the same time, you need to fit into the local council members, maybe their political leagues. But at the same time, for the local citizens, so you have the discovery card for the local people. It's free of charge. They can um, enter the, the room and baths. So how can you balance these different shareholders' needs and their own privileges? Um, uh, well, it is a balancing. Um, uh, but uh, the, uh, there are quite a lot of World Heritage sites now around the world. And uh, uh, one or two of them are at risk. Mm -hmm. And those that are at risk are usually because they have had some form of disconnection with their local public. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, uh, there aren't very many on the UNESCO Heritage at Risk list, and I think only one or two have only ever been declassified um, uh, for transgressions. Um, in fact, in the UK, there is uh, one site uh, that uh, is uh, on the heritage at risk list, I think, which is the city of Liverpool and its dockyards, mm. um, where the, the charge is that it's suffering from overdevelopment. Um, <clears throat> but um, the, uh, uh, so 
uh, with um, uh, with that, um, uh, the uh, I think the local audience is something that you need to care for if you want to protect um, a world heritage site. A world heritage site doesn't come with any legislative control. It is simply a designation. It's somebody has out there has said it's important. Um, so that's a message to the local people who are responsible for the management of it. That might be a, a national agency, it might be a local council, uh, it could, in theory it could even be a private landowner, although these things are usually in uh, the public domain in some way. Um, that's all it is, it doesn't actually carry any guarantees of security. Um, so caring uh, for the interests of uh, local people uh, inviting them in to um, uh, participate and contribute in some way is the best way, I think, to secure the interests of the site for the future. Uh, I was quite struck by the uh, image of um, uh, the uh, Bishop's Hill uh, site uh, that was shown, I think it was in Nicky's um, presentation, it showed the city and Bishop's Hill as a green hill with all these skyscrapers all around it. And I thought uh, when I saw that, crikey, you've got a really interesting local community there. <laughs> and uh, uh, whatever the merits of the reservoir, Bishop's Hill is a very special place in that city um, uh, because it is an island of green. And uh, it really is a, a place that I think must be very special to many people um, for that quality. And uh, the fact that it also has a reservoir as well, uh, you know, just adds to its interest really as uh, a natural phenomenon, a natural space within the city. Okay, thank you, Stephen. So Nikki, maybe you have some ideas from uh, Stephen's um, information, especially for the landscape. Uh, another two questions from uh, two uh, uh, attendants for Tim uh, from uh, Chris Chan. Um, uh, fascinating comparison, Tim. I would like to ask, uh, what expected or unexpected ongoing conservation related care or maintenance issues have you observed or had to deal with, with at the Paddington Garden site in Sydney since its competition that may inform the potential conservation of Bishop Hill Reservoir in Hong Kong? Well, I, I mean, I think what's interesting is that the original materials, the brick and the uh, cast iron and the lime are actually weathering better than the new materials that we put in there. The steel needs, um, <laughs> needs repainting. Um, I, I think there was a... Um, we did a lot of work with the brick arches because historically um, there were steel beams, well, not steel, um, cast iron beams supporting brick vaults, which then had a very um, a solid clay on top and the clay held the brickwork down. Um, we had to remove all that brickwork and put an invisible, actually very high tech concrete slab, but we didn't want to see it um, uh, over the top. So, I mean, that, that was the most important thing was really holding it all together. Um, ironically, using um, contemporary uh, structural engineering standards. So historically, the vaults were held together with the weight of the clay, um, remembering that uh, just north of Sydney in the late 1980s, there was an earthquake at Newcastle, which caused the whole rewriting of all of the structural codes. And so we then had to get rid of the clay and put in a, a concrete slab uh, the, to tie it together. But um, th there is one sort of uh, offshoot. It's, it's not, not a real direct answer to the question, but it's, it's an interesting thing about the reservoir. The, the City Council asked which of, well, they gave us a choice of three park benches would we like to put in the reservoir? And we said, well, it's not really, it's a garden, it's rooms, it's not really a park. We'd much prefer to put chairs in there and people could move them around where the sun was. 
and they said that okay we, we, we get the we get the, the, the point um, we'll put 12 chairs in there and when they've all been stolen we'll put our park benches in and you won't get a choice um, and a journalist was absolutely fascinated that there were chairs in a public space and she wrote an article about these chairs um, and started to interview people around there and how they used used them uh, there was another group who would come and put them in one place. There was another group who put them in another place. And she even found that there were some students who lived around the corner who were having a dinner party and they were short of chairs. So they pinched three for the night. Um, they took them to their house, but they, they, they brought them back the next, the next morning. And when the article was written, which was several years ago now, there were still 12, 12 chairs there. And, and that's an aside, but it's sort of, um, I think once you start to make things that communities value um, and take ownership of these sorts of things like benches can be replaced uh, uh, with chairs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. The next question from uh, Joanne Lin Ao, uh, also for you. Uh, was there any request during the Pennington exercise that the Sydney water supply system of the same era need to be studied and preserve to complete the story puzzle. Um, if 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 I um, no, the, the, the pretty much no, because it hadn't been used for more than a hundred hundred years. Um, the reservoir was disused in the eighteen nineties, um, and the reason was that there's very little head between the top of the ridge where all the the nice houses in Paddington were. They, were. they were closer to the ridge than lower down in the valley. So as the reservoir level dropped during the day, so did the water pressure in the houses. And then they moved it further along Oxford Street up into what's called Centennial Park. Um, so no, there was, there, were, there really was, and unfortunately all of the uh, pump, pump house equipment was long gone. That would have been taken off to other, other, other reservoirs. Mm -hmm. And Tim, may I add uh, one more follow-up question about the threat of climate change? Because mm -hmm. you also, you know, um, you have the uh, adaptive reuse uh, on this Paddington Reservoir. When you um, have your architectural plans, uh, because it is almost, you know, many years, and uh, right now we are talking more about the climate change. So how can you um, deal with this for the maintenance, especially for um, this reservoir? Um, well, well, I guess there's, there's lots and lots of layers to that question, but um, if one is around the environment and keeping urban spaces cool, I mean, I think that's, that's one of the, the, the sort of themes that come out of the question, is that yes, that's very much done with structures in, 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 in planting, but I think um, <coughs> um, we... Uh, because it was a, a city council asset and right next door to the reservoir was the Paddington Town Hall, which was also owned by the city of Sydney. We asked them if we could collect the water off the town hall, which pretty much occupied its site 100%. We put it into a big tank um, next to the reservoir, which was up at, up at, up at grade. And then that, that gave us a tank to actually, with gravity, feed feed the plant so we created a, a with water so we created our own uh, our, our, i guess our new reservoir which um of course wasn't made of beautiful brick vaults it's a concrete box but um it it um so we restore it we store we store the water and in fact when we were designing the reservoir sydney was in a state of drought uh, at the time so it was very easy to get people to focus on the importance so i think um we collect water to uh, for the plants, and then the way the plants are are located and organised, it's very much around shadow. And I didn't point it out in the plan, but at the bottom right corner of the eastern reservoir, we built a huge um, uh, concrete tub. It's about five by five by three, and we put a Angophora or a Sydney 
I said a Sydney gum in there, which shades that portion of, of, of the park. Because that's one of the issues. It's very difficult to find deep soil on the site because it was either a very, very, um, uh, a very important in heritage terms, lime casing to the reservoir, or just the surface on the top that was only ever capable of growing grass. Thank you, Tim. So um, a group of general questions from Libby Chan. Uh, many thanks for all the speakers for the wonderful and inspiring talks. And um, she want to ask all the speaker, could the speaker share about how the public engagement could contribute to push the conservation forward in the case of Bishop Hill Reservoir? <laughs> Vicky or Shita, you know more than us because you went there. <laughs> yeah, maybe I talk a little bit my opinion first um, about public engagement because uh, I think that uh, once uh, this um, um, demolition of the heritage was discovered last week, um, there are uh, this aroused uh, very many uh, tremendous attention to the public online and um, to even the government. And many, I think uh, many the citizens of local citizens, um, they use their own ways to participate uh, in make Maybe they go to take pictures on the first day. They they not sure how how they, they are not sure how they can help to preserve this. And some other uh, expert may um, help to gather more information about the history of this reservoir. I think uh, different people are um, using different um, uh, the expertise to help to preserve this. And and finally, the government are willing to stop the the works. And I think uh, we should uh, keep this um public engagement ongoing and also uh, I also appreciate that um, um, there's many discussion and many um, forums these few days that um, talk about how uh, the race for us and how to improve the heritage conservation. I think, yeah, we just keep this, um, um, the government just keep um, the, all the people engaged and also different stakeholders engaged and this could really help to contribute to the conservation uh, in the future. Um, frankly, I have the same question to the uh, speakers today. Actually, which party or is it the district council play the most important role in balancing the opinions uh, among different stakeholders and help to design the final um, design scheme? So, anybody? Tim? <laughs> Well, maybe I'll, I'll kind of have a, 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 a go because, again, th this is such a huge um, issue, but it would appear that if the local community can stop demolition, I mean, I've never seen that happen. I mean, in Sydney, once something starts being demolished, they never stop until it's finished. So there's obviously an incredibly powerful local community or a, a government body that's willing to listen and that would appear to be very fertile ground for getting a good, a really good, good outcome. I think, and, and I don't know how it is in, in Hong Kong, but in Sydney, um, public space is sacrosanct because it keeps getting shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And uh, when you start to look at utilities, so if the water board, the reservoir, that, that's, that's a utility, but if you go back through the historic records, you will probably find that that was public land before it was a utility. And again, I, I'm just, that's, that's a hypothesis. I don't know that for a fact, but in Sydney, that would have been the, the case. So then, then, then becomes this debate around public, public land. You know, should public land be totally commercialized? Should it be um, peripherally commercialized, you know, a little bit like Stephen's diagram, you need that commercial component to create a future. And, and, is, and if managed well, there's lots of fantastic benefits uh, um, to do with that because bringing other people to the area, that, that makes the people who live there feel very good about themselves because people have come to see the area. Uh, it, it's kind of special. So there's all of this, um, I guess these ideas around publicness and, and, and what that means. And then ultimately, I think coming back to that previous question around um, 
environment and and climate change is you know this is clearly a green lung one of one of uh, Hong Kong's green lungs and, and that um, is really important that 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 stays as well so there's some very good platforms there being um, you know a, a very good level of public engagement which leads to kind of public scrutiny in a way it's then asking the question of what do we do with infrastructure land when it no longer serves an infrastructure purpose is it public land or does it become commercialized and then there's this kind of environmental argument about um, which parts of the city do we do we keep green and then you've got all of the kind of interstitial land which is between the the dense city and the open space and and, and how do you manage that and generally there's a kind of whole range of really rich uses that can come uh, into that but I think I think the real key for these sites is to give them a future you know you can't you can't turn them into a museum you can't uh, freeze them and turn them into an exhibit but they have to you know they have to have a future and they have to engage with lots of different people in the city you know you have tourism at one end and locals at the other and you kind of want everybody in between to be able to come here and to get some um, some benefit from it mm -hmm. interesting and Sam also posted uh, a Facebook audience also mentioned that give a place respect and the community will respect it in return. Yeah, Stephen, um, for your time, because you have mentioned that you have million, millions of tourists uh, from all over the world. So <laughs> in Bishop Hughes case, how do you think? Um, <clears throat> I didn't catch everything you said there, but um, uh, yes, the, uh, the Roman Baths does have, uh, well, in a normal year, over a million visitors, uh, far less this year. Um, uh, we're down to about a quarter of a million this year. Um, but um, uh, the, uh, uh, those people coming uh, can put a pressure on uh, local society and the local economy, and there can be resistance to that. Um, uh, it can uh, affect uh, transport systems and, um, um, and uh, start gradually to alter the character of spaces around uh, 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 popular places. And uh, this is something that isn't always welcome to the local community. Um, and uh, so I think it's something that has to have very careful management. Um, and. Uh, uh, that is one, one of the reasons why it's so very important um, in managing sites like this, uh, that uh, good relations are maintained with that uh, local community. Um, it, uh, quite often it's their heritage more than anyone else's that uh, uh, we're, we're protecting. Um, and uh, you know, Bishop Hill probably wouldn't be uh, um, such great interest to uh, uh, someone a thousand miles away. Um, but they might just visit it in passing. <laughs> we want people to visit and not leave a footprint, really, or not to make an impact on the, on the local environment if it can be minimised and managed. Um, the, but uh, I think it's also important that tourists aren't always just seen as being the milk cow that uh, um, uh, is uh, just going to deliver the necessary income to operate these things. Uh, I think the local authority, the local community also has to have its own investment um, in, uh, in places um, and uh, uh, so that it has a sort of more balanced approach to visitors um, so that they are treated with respect um, and uh, uh, not just seen as uh, something to be exploited. Um, so I'm not sure if I quite answered the first part of what you said because I didn't hear it exactly, but those are some thoughts. Yeah, I think that's right. How about uh, Jim, because you work in um, the um, uh, Constantinople, uh, I also know that actually it's also a world heritage. So it still have a problem in Basilica system, there's a lot of visitors. So how to balance it? I think you need to turn on your mic. You need to turn on your mic first. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, I'm, to, be, to be fair, I'm not as familiar as I was since over the last few years, I haven't been visiting Istanbul as regularly mm -hmm. as I had formerly. Um, there, there have, uh, you know, sometimes this is, this is an issue of national and local politics, obviously. And, and it's difficult for me as an outsider to comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I do recognize that in Istanbul that there have been some improvements. I mean, there's one particular system that was um, in inverted commas restored about 25 years ago. And the architect who did it, I met him at another event and he said, oh, I restored that. And I didn't really like to say anything to him because it was a catastrophe basically. Um, and it was then turned into an entirely inappropriate usage, which was what was called a Ruspazar, which meant it was for the sale of Russian fur. Um, and it was a very strange squalid place. And, but um, I'm pleased to know that some of my Turkish colleagues, I recently understood from them that they're carrying out a new restoration and new study of the building. But I don't know as yet what's gonna happen to it in the future. Um, but there is this challenge, particularly when you have so many ancient structures, which are not, don't obviously have a, you know, you can't turn them into parts because they've got, you know, they're, they're covered. And they're, they're quite dark spaces. They weren't intended as public spaces. So how do you actually use them? And some, like the Yerabatansarai, potentially has too many and has, from the last time I saw it, rather inappropriate um, presentation, uh, not really reflecting the history or the, the, the use of the building at all. It was, it was really... It was just that it was the spectacle rather than anything else. So you couldn't, you didn't, you didn't gain anything about why it was there or for that reason. Um, so there are, as I say, there are lots of challenges and it's difficult, as I say, for me to comment. I think I'll come away from this session actually with more ideas than I think I've been able to give because, and I will go back to my Turkish colleagues and not immediately and try and feed in some ideas because I think uh, I, I found it extremely rewarding for that reason, but for just thinking about the, the whole problems of presentation and, and engagement. And, um, and I'll talk to Kerim Maltu and I'll talk to other Turkish colleagues about this. So, but that's, so I, it's difficult, as I say, otherwise for me to, to make any. Yeah, absolutely to understand my, um, what I can do, especially I work in on call, especially for the public engagement, I need to work with them. And I always realize that I'm the outsider. So I must, but, but the first thing I should do is I must respect my local colleagues because uh, what we were, as you totally understand as an archaeologist, you always need to work with uh, the local people and respect the local villagers. Otherwise, you cannot conduct any research or excavation work. Yeah. And uh, from uh, one of our attendants, uh, Learn Car Man, um, uh, he or she think that it should first serve the local community first as there is immense lack of public space in that area, it should spark a wider discussion of the city planning strategy first. Complete commercialized and tourist lead uh, approach should be avoided. And another uh, opinion and also a question from Libby Chan is about the educational purposes and for the rediscovery of Hong Kong history how important we could use this case to understand the water system, uh, um, urban landscape development and colonial history in the global contexts. And what is the best way to convert and research all this important history for all walks uh, for, of life to the local citizens? Would there be good to be a museum plus a public space plus recreational park or in one or other alternatives? <laughs> Nikki or Sita, because I think only two of you went there. <laughs> um, I, I think I, I can um, talk more about um, about the what what to be um, used in the future. And it's also uh, related to our last uh, discussion that um, whether it should be more for locals or more for I mean for locals really for the neighborhood uh, surrounding the 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 Bishop Hills and or really for more for a uh, greater, greater scope for the Hong Kong people to use that place, maybe as a museum or public space or whatever. I, I think that um, uh, before we, um, we want, before we, we decide what to be used, um, I think we have to understand um, the technical constraint from the size. Um, 
because um um the the site is uh, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation is um uh, really on top of a hill and then there's no um vehicular access or even um um uh, the people if uh, they are from from the the bottom of the hill of, of the hill they have to take the steps up to go up to the hill so that um um if we are going to um consider what to be used in the future if we are going to use for a museum that maybe attract um, more Hong Kong people there or even attract some of the overseas tourists there um, they may have to um, know how much um, uh, foresee how much um, 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 uh, visitors are going to there and then how the visitors are going to go up to the hill uh, um, um, I think this um, we have to understand that some of the technical um, concerns um, um, before we can know the, the future use there. I think uh, it's good uh, we, we imagine what can be used, what to be used inside, uh, but I think um, it's also important we um, need to strike a balance um, for the low cost for neighborhoods or even um, yeah, the, the, the water sense people to use that. Um, but how about the case of, I, I think also Sita also know about that. Um, how do you think about the case of Tycoon? Uh, the old police station with the sponsorship of Chucky Cup for preservation development and working closely with the Antiquity and Monument Office. So what kinds of imagination and technical consideration mm -hmm. required uh, for the usage of the space, such mm -hmm. as being museum or public recreation, recreation mm -hmm. space for the public? I think no matter uh, what revitalization schemes uh, we adopted um, finally, two technical uh, considerations have to be tackled regarding the public safety. The first thing is about the statutory issues in Hong Kong. So how to convert the building so that it can comply the existing fire safety code and the barrier free access is an uh, important issues. And also um, about the structural safety because uh, the water tank is not decided to take a huge load above it. Um, so it will, uh, it will require a very detailed structural analysis um, before and to see, um, see if the existing, existing structure is okay or um, restrengthening works is required. Mm, I see. And uh, from Sam, uh, he uh, called a comment uh, from our uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook audience. Uh, he or she uh, talk about Hong Kong is also on its own journey for heritage adaptive reuse. Early adaptive reuse projects were quite immature in their approach. So other like Marine uh, Police Station in Chim Sa Choi, I think that one is uh, 1881, okay, uh, were overly commercial and the magic of the place was lost. And recently it's Tycoon and PMQ, we have um, very... Uh, Okay, let me see. Uh, have seen a more mature approach. And Bishop Hill is an opportunity for Hong Kong to build further on a balanced approach, which is not just commercial. So it's rather disappointed that after the three star ferry court tower and uh, Queen's Pier incidents in 2006, the government is still nagging behind um, public's concern about the heritage preservation from uh, oh, Niger Oakley and also uh, Alan Yu. Uh, Alan Yu has an other uh, comments or give uh, information about the original Chinese name of Bishop Hill is Wo Chai San. It's already diluted, uh, it's a basin sort of uh, topography, which means in circular shape. Yeah, so in Chinese, we can understand more than Bishop Hill, but Bishop Hill also have a special meaning. Someone have already conducted some research on that, I think. Yes. Okay, so a more, uh, should I say a difficult question? Yeah, <laughs> especially two of our uh, speakers uh, come from UK. Uh, how, uh, from Patrick Yu, how to tell the story about the British colonial era's uh, heritage in Hong Kong, especially in the mainland of China is an important question to project the future. My question is the scholars attitudes and suggestions about this thing. Well, perhaps I can, I'm not going to comment on uh, either British colonial past or um, China, but all I can say is that it's interesting thinking about the, the long-term heritage in, in Istanbul. Because remember, 
1453, the city which had been a Roman Byzantine city became a Turkish city. And since then, uh, particularly after the creation of the Turkish Republic in 1923, Turkey has adopted uh, a, a, narrative, a historical narrative, which has to a large degree stressed a Turkish past. And the majority, particularly now, the majority of people who live in Istanbul, whereas previously it was a very um, heterogeneous population, uh, it's, it's, it's very largely Turkish. Um, and it's a Turkish past. And so one of the challenges that I have, and my colleagues who are Byzantinists, who are interested in an earlier era, is that we're interested in a past which isn't necessarily the sort of the standard past which is in the Turkish school books. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's not such a dissimilar question to the one you've asked, because you're talking about competing histories here. You're talking about one competing history, which is essentially a Chinese one, and another one which has to engage with a British colonial past. Mm -hmm. So it's not unique, uh, but it's an interest. The one I face is actually somewhat more difficult because it's not one which is so easily defined. Whereas I think in terms of a uh, in terms of post-colonial studies, you know, we're overwhelmed by post-colonial studies. So I don't want to, you know, go there. Except all I'm saying is that when I'm dealing with a very large system in Istanbul, it is essentially the creation of a society and uh, a polity which is quite different from the one which is the standard institutional policy of contemporary Turkey. Mm -hmm. So there is there is this challenge here, and I'm not going to go any further into that because it's it becomes much too political beyond that. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I I, I absolutely understand. When I were in on call with my Cambodian colleagues, because you know they are also working in the post-colonial period, but. Uh, for a very, very long time, basically, uh, most of the documentation um, were done by French, um, yeah. like yeah, colo uh, colonial archaeologists. So yeah, we, we should do it very carefully, and especially for the interpretation. We, we will try to make it scholarly and discuss scholarly uh, with our colleagues. So how about Stephen and Tim? Commonwealth representative. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, a tricky one and quite challenging uh, sort of question, really. And uh, I'm certainly not sure I know the answer to it. Um, the uh, uh, as uh, as Jim said, there there are many histories about a place. Um, you can uh, look at a, a, a place through uh, the prism of um, uh, colonial history. Uh, but there were other histories going on at the same time um, uh, that had probably had nothing much to do with colonial history, really, but were probably taking place in the same place. Um, and uh, the <clears throat> um, the uh, so uh, it's, it's a broad, much broader question than just Bishop Sill, of course, and how Hong Kong challenges that. Uh, but uh, I think it needs to acknowledge that it has more than one history um, and uh, probably have a place where there's uh, an opportunity for people to discuss competing histories, um, which would uh, be uh, an interesting sort of uh, interpretation centre or uh, a kind of modern history centre where this could be done. Um, uh, we, we see uh, in, the, in uh, the United Kingdom competing histories, so you only have to go to Northern Ireland um, to uh, see that, uh, where you know, traditionally there have been two communities who have a completely different worldview to each other um, and uh, live in enforced coexistence uh, within a small island. Um, and... Uh, uh, encouraging people to appreciate that other people might have a history that's perhaps different in emphasis to themselves. Um, uh, when you are in a small country where there are a lot of people living cheek by jowl, um, uh, it's uh, probably one of the best ways to uh, promote uh, social cohesion for the future. 
Interesting. And uh, it responds from Elijah. I do not see this as a, as a conflict. Just look at the uh, uh, burn in Shanghai, a great China's, uh, a great Chinese city. Current politics should not pose the conflict. They um, they are people think it might be and base it without fear. What about him? Mm. Well, look, I, I don't have any insights, but just an observation. Uh, and I'm assuming that because the colonial history was, was recent, it was probably well documented and that would be a kind of absolutely fascinating study to look at how it was documented in England and how it was documented in Hong Kong and between that you'd have this kind of you know you'd have two views of of of, of the same thing it becomes but I, I think that certainly from a um, you know I, I guess in the way we work with um, heritage listings of buildings, et cetera, in Sydney is the, the whole basis of heritage themes, whether they be technological, political, about particular people, um, about the geography. It's, I think it's, you know, the kind of, I guess the interesting way or maybe the mature way is to actually identify all these different themes. And then within the political history, there would be a series of, of, of sub themes because on the site there's actually a very interesting technical history. There's a very interesting history around water um, that was, you know, so brilliantly set out in all of Nikki's diagrams. You know that that you know it's not you know there's there's more to it than the conflict of of of, of people and and because it was a hill, obviously it has a whole series of benefits that go with that. So I, I think it's. It's mapping all those different stories is, is um, not only makes the site very rich, but it makes it very interesting for, for people who live or go there. Okay, so uh, time is running out and, uh, and um, questions from Sarah Chan. How could public be more involved throughout the conservation process? Perhaps even for the early stage of this, um, deciding the heritage grading or a scheme, a schematic design. So how can they involve? <laughs> Especially, it's, it's quite difficult to collaborate with architect, right? <laughs> how can you collect the public ideas? Oh, architects are easy to collaborate with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's, um, I mean, I would have to say the local community seem, seem onto it. So, um, well, I, I think there's, um, you know, there's, there's almost um, cultural plans, there's almost master plans. The cultural plan may inform the master plan and the master plan just doesn't talk about the reservoir. It talks about its precinct and then the precincts beyond that. What are the precincts that feed into that precinct? So I think the, the kind of master planning and the precinct Basis and th those master plans can be informed by uh, whether it's a cultural framework. You know, you could could even look at that as more more like a framework. So there's a there's something that's before the master plan. So it's talking about what are the cultural values, what are the policies, what's trying to be achieved here, and then there's the master plan that really just lays out how some of these cultural objectives could be achieved and that in turn may inform a business case or a financial plan, whether it's even a, a, a government plan of how, how the money could be, could be funded or whether it's, it's um, privately or commercially uh, found. Um, and, then, and then there's a kind of a timeline. I mean, a timeline, this is a very big site. It's not going to all happen in... In, in the famous seven days, you know, it's going to take years. And then there's a kind of mechanism within the master planning that says that we set out to do this, but if these things happen, then the master plan actually may, may morph slightly because we, uh, you know, nobody really knows what's going to happen in five, 10, 20 years. We think we do, but things always work out differently. So th there's, there's possibly a little bit about that, putting a time plan to it. I see. Um, from Learn Carmen, um, he or she asked about 
how would you suggest the local to establish an efficient platform to voice their voice and be taken seriously in government Hong Kong and its really lack of well-organized conservation group? Could any speaker explain how, uh, let's say, historic England come to place? <laughs> how to deal with locals? Yeah, I, I think, Stephen, you have many experience on that, right? <laughs> 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 um, yes, the uh, uh, some, but um, uh, the uh, uh, not usually over controversial issues. Um, uh, it must be said, um, and uh, the um, it, it comes down to consultation, really, doesn't it? And how effective your consultation processes are. Um, and uh, for consultation to work, it needs some people to speak their views and uh, make them, and uh, have the forum to do that, and for other people to listen. Uh, it doesn't mean they have to agree and uh, act upon what they're asked to uh, say, but they should at least offer the courtesy of listening, and where they can, they should respond to the points raised. Um, the uh, so you need the forum for that to happen in. And you want to try and set that up in a way that's non-confrontational. Um, and now that, uh, also, that's very easy to say, it's uh, not always uh, easy to do, uh, particularly if you're in a charged atmosphere. Um, but um, uh, the uh, actually having that um, uh, setting in which it can happen where uh, people can feel that they have the opportunity to express a view and for it to be heard and listened to, uh, I think uh, it can be really quite important. I think the other thing is if, if a forum is established in the local community, um, have representatives who that they put their faith and trust in, and it may, that representative may just represent one particular aspect of the local community's concern. So let's say it's public open space or open space. Um, somebody might be more interested in community um, uses. You know, what, what are the institutions that need to be, or, or the types of, whether it's schools or museums or, or whatever, but these people become ambassadors or champions for those, those causes. And the, I think the key to picking those people is that they know um, you know, they're, they're, they're informed, they don't need to be experts, but they, they're informed in that area and they're, I guess, skilled negotiators so that they don't push it straight to conflict at meeting one because there's, there's lot, lots of um, ebb, 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 and, ebb and flow, just as I imagine the government agencies would have representatives as well. So it's almost identifying representatives and and that representative could have a meeting with the local community and the local community says you know th there's a workshop with the local community and they identify that these are the top 10 issues to us they put those into a hierarchy and then that person you know it's like a form of democracy in a way that that person then goes and negotiates around those oh, those 10 issues that sort of thing yes yeah, I agree with Tim. Um, so last question from Lisa Lee is about the cultural heritage law in Hong Kong. So, but I think uh, this question, actually we cannot, we, we, we are not the best person to answer it. It's about, <laughs> uh, and I was wondering whether there have been any attempts yet to have the Bishop Hill Westerfer declared as monument under the Antiquity and Monument Ordinance. So do you have any feedbacks on the protection of um, the Bishop Hill so far under the uh, ordinance, what is good or bad about Hong Kong legal regime for its protection? Yeah, I, yeah, but I think at the moment, um, uh, we, we just build up a platform in uh, academic discussion and give some ideas to the governments or the officials or even related stakeholders for have um, further discussion on that. And I, I think it's, I think we do what we can do. <laughs> and um, uh, let's see, because uh, in a little, uh, around uh, March, uh, for the Antiquity and Advisory Board, they will have the meeting to discuss uh, whether this Bishop Hill under Guan Reservoir 
uh, may be declared as the historic uh, building or a uh, declared monument. So uh, at this moment, uh, we cannot uh, answer uh, Lisa anything, but uh, it's a good question for us to um, uh, look at this and think more about that. Okay, so as time is running out, so um, thank you so much for uh, all of you, all of, all of you uh, attend um, this talk. So uh, here I would like to show you, uh, uh, because I can see many questions, many questions and comments from um, the uh, Facebook Live. So if you have uh, further feedbacks or uh, um, questions, you can uh, scan this QR code or uh, you access this link. Uh, maybe Sam, you can post the, yeah, you can post the link uh, to the audience. So can you, have, you can fill up the form and uh, put your question and comments and uh, I, I can uh, send this to uh, the officials, the related officials and also the antiquities and um, uh, advisory board members. So for their consideration. And also, um, we are very welcome you to follow our uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, or WeChat uh, to follow our future events or other academic uh, activities. So um, maybe what can you uh, change to the uh, gallery mode? Change the gallery mode uh, for all of us, uh, including our um, webinar staff. Uh, I, I would like to take a good photos all together and I want to, um, uh, share my acknowledgement to um, the people who work behind the scene. Um, at the very beginning, I would like to thank you all our guest speaker of this uh, webinar uh, for all the success of uh, is, um, uh, present a fantastic and very inspiring talks to us. And um, also the, um, our Hong Kong Heritage Exploration Facebook page co-founder Cherry. Yeah, I should say thank you to her. Yeah, she worked behind the scene. And uh, Nikki today is a representative. And uh, also the Department of Anthropology, uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, including our, our team, Kathy, Wa, Lin, Ellen, uh, Sam. Sam is our PhD candidate. And uh, Melody, she is uh, our MPhil um, student. And also very important for our IT uh, SC service, CUHK, Judy Lowe and her colleagues and her team and also the communication and public relations uh, office from CUHK and uh, Hong Kong um, uh, reminiscent Facebook owner grant her photo for our uh, poster production. Uh, this person is very important. He also gave us many comments. It's a team's good friends, uh, Liger Ockley. Um, he helped to line up uh, me and team uh, and invite you to be our webinar speaker. And of course, uh, all our attendants to join this interdisciplinary one table webinar. So thank you very much. And uh, I know that many uh, Facebook uh, attendants also asked about whether uh, we may uh, record this um, webinar. Uh, yes, uh, after our Facebook Live, after you stop it, you can uh, recap uh, our this webinar again. So just in case you miss, miss anything or you cannot attend, uh, the talk at the beginning, you can still uh, can uh, uh, view it again and again, okay? And I will also share it to uh, the related uh, officials or shareholders. So maybe we can uh, get more information from um, different cases um, from the uh, intellectual scholar. Yes. So thank you so much. Uh, what can you share all of our uh, people? Staff. Oh, okay. Together behind the scene, including yourself. <laughs> if you are convenient, yeah. Uh, you we don't need to take the good photo, but at least oh. we have a screen to, uh, show all of us. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, he's wa. Yeah, he. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I <laughs> yeah yeah. Stephen and Tim know that we have other special webinar testing, <laughs> for you. So and also uh some of our uh staff and uh students for their help for their support so can make all the success uh for this. Um, interdisciplinary um, uh, webinar together and uh, in a very short notice, especially for, for Jim, for Stephen and Kim and even Nikki and Shita. Yeah, <laughs> you know that uh, we only have, I, I, I calculate, we, I only have one week, <laughs> actually. Amazing. <laughs> <Spare> everything, <laughs> yeah. Mm. And finally, we can get it done. Yes, yeah, so here we go. So thank you so much uh, for this. So we must stop now and um, 
uh, in the future, see you again. Uh, uh, welcome to follow our Facebook and uh, Stephen, Shika, Jim, Tim, and Nikki. Keep in, let's keep in touch. Yeah, see yes. what will happen. Yeah, okay, see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Good afternoon and good night. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Edu. Thank you. Thank you, Wa. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. okay, you can, I think you can stop the Facebook live. Okay. Yeah, you stop it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.